Okay, so hopefully this time this should work. Uh, let me just make sure. Yeah, so my headphones are connected. Are they making the little blink? Are they making the... Are, is a light going on? Hygiene camera. Um, let me just make sure these are connected. I mean, I don't hear anything yet on the line. So, let me... Um, hi, Austin Catalano. I don't know who you are, but from the tiniest little thumbnail picture, you are very attractive. Um, let me invite her back to this chat. Uh, okay, one second. Let me come on back here. And... Uh, get off the screen. Signs in my... Uh, okay, here we go. So, um, I am about to go live with Dr. Priyam with the Nike. We are going to have a uh, quick update on the new um, variant. Sorry, I'm going to turn my light on as long as I'm as long as I'm doing a big official thing here. Uh, sorry for my messy room. I, I didn't realize I'd be doing a broadcast. Well, I was about to do a broadcast because I was about to. Uh, aw, you're very welcome, Austin. Um, I'm going to troll your Instagram after this and uh, double tap a bunch of pictures. So just um, go with it, I guess. All right. So, um, okay, great. I am... I'm going to try adding Dr. Nike one more time. I just texted her. To, maybe it didn't go... Okay, I'm back. I just sent her that message. Maybe it didn't go through yet. I'll wait a couple of minutes for her to join us. So in the meantime, um, I hope you... Can you guys hear me okay? Are you hearing me through... Aw, oh, thank you, Austin. You know what? I got two phones, so I'm going to start double tapping you now while we wait. <laughs> um, I um, got these new headphones, so I'm wondering... Are you hearing me through the headphones? So can you hear this? Do you hear that when I tap on the headphones? Um, let me know. Uh, yes, I can hear that or no, we don't hear that. Um, alternately, if I tap on the phone here, do you hear that through the phone's microphone? Um, I guess it doesn't matter which microphone you hear me through. It just matters what, what uh, I hear you through on this call. Um, so Matthew is back. Hi, Matthew. Welcome. I am just waiting for Dr. Nike to join. I think it's going through the headphones. You just have phone sound. So you mean, hi, Stephen. Uh, so you mean you're hearing it through this mic or this mic? Why are those headphones don't work while recording? Really? Okay, as long as it's putting her in my ears, I think it'll prevent that uh, problem that we just had. Ah, and she's back. Okay, great. Um, I'm still going to look up Austin um, while we are uh, getting started. Austin. Everyone look up Austin Catalano because these are dangerous, difficult times. Um, and so it always helps to have... Um, to have like a really handsome Sicilian man to follow on Instagram, a really handsome Sicilian vegan man. Um, and I'm just kidding. I don't know if you're vegan, but if you're not, I set you up to have to say, I'm not vegan to which I'll say, Hey, no one's perfect. All right. Let me bring Dr. Nike on. Here we go. I hope this works. I hope this works. Can you hear me? I can. How about you? And I, I don't, I I don't hear you. an echo. Okay. I don't know what that was. I, that, I don't know if it that, was you or me. I think it was me, and I think... Oh, he is vegan! He's not only handsome, he's also vegan. Five years! Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, that shouldn't happen unless... I've tried going live with someone else in the same room with me, so we're like split screen like this, right. and that causes that. Right. Uh, anyway, so um, I didn't know that we were going to do this, and I'm so grateful that you did, because I was yeah. trying to post that story yeah. from my other phone. So I literally have, like, five minutes. I'm actually yeah, still yeah. at work, so I don't really okay. have okay, a great. ton of time. But great. I just wanted to I, – I happened to see that you were live, and I just thought yeah. I'd, I'd uh, uh, just basically talk about – we don't know a ton yet about the New York variant. What we do know is concerning – Early indications are that it may, in fact, be resistant 
to neutralizing antibodies into the vaccine. We don't know for sure. And again, part of that is because we don't really know how many, uh, new, how much neutralizing antibody do we actually need in order for it to be effective. In other words, if I have 30% antibody, is that enough? Do I need 60%? Is 5% enough? You know, we just don't have a good sense of that. And does it vary from variant to variant? In other words, for the UK variant, do we need more antibody? Yeah. But maybe for the South Africa variant, we need less. The major concern with the New York one is it seems to be spreading relatively rapidly. Now, is that, and again, this is early days. So is this because, because basically there's two potential reasons why that could be happening, right? One is, like the UK variant, it's just more easily transmissible, right? The other reason is people just aren't being very careful. And so therefore it's getting passed around quicker, or it could be a combination of the two, right? So the reason, I mean, I don't think anybody should be panicking, right? Like people shouldn't be like, oh, well, there's no point in me getting a vaccine because I live in New York, right? Because that isn't the only variant, number one. Right. Number two, we, again, we don't know if it will confer a little bit of protection. So as an example, I, I think it was, like, and I almost hesitate to use this example because so many people keep comparing COVID to the flu and it's not at all like the flu. Right. But, but about, I don't know, five or six years ago, there was a flu uh, going around, I think it was influenza B, I don't think it was A, I don't remember now. In any event, it wasn't really well covered by the vaccine. So we saw a lot of increased rates of flu and flu deaths because of that, because the vaccine didn't cover it very well. Mm -hmm. But it did confer a little bit of protection. It didn't confer great protection, but it did confer a little bit. So the largest question that we need to answer is, for the New York variant, is it going to confer any protection at all? If it does confer protection, is it going to confer protection in the same way that the vaccines currently confer protection, which is that it reduces your risk of death or severe disease, right? So the reason that I still wear a mask when I go to the store is not only because I'm not an asshole, but also <laughs> because, I mean, well, I probably am, but not when it comes to masks, <laughs> you know? Um, so the reason that it's important that we wear masks, even if we're vaccinated, is because we haven't yet shown that me being vaccinated means I can't get it, pick it up, either have a mild case of it or be asymptomatic and then transmit Thank it. You. Thank you. Right. So that's the main thing. And in fact, in some ways, you could make the argument that being vaccinated could potentially make you a scarier person if you're slack. Right. Because you may you might decide to be the person who goes, oh, I'm vaccinated. I can do whatever I want to do and be careless. Right. There so, are people are doing that. Right. So it's really important that we understand that that is just not the case. Now, the CDC just released some recommendations today and it did include things like if you're vaccinated, if everybody around you is vaccinated, you could take off your masks, even if you're indoors and and hang out and things like that. They also said that. If you are vaccinated and you are going to visit one family, one enclosed unit of people that doesn't have a lot of risk and things household. like that, one household, you can go visit them if you are unvaccinated. I mean, if you are vaccinated, as long as the people in that household are not high risk. But the thing I wish they had said is it's not just what their risk is, right? So as an example, if I decide I want to go visit my sister in D.C., OK, her kids aren't vaccinated. She is because she's a teacher. Um, her husband isn't vaccinated. Um, he's a little on the older side. I mean, not super old, but, you know, a little bit older, has maybe a couple things that might make him a little bit high risk. But the larger issue is let's for our, they're not doing this, but let's for argument's sake, say that um, his mother lived in the U.S. His mother does not live in the U.S., but let's say she lived in the U.S., and he was helping to take care of her. Mm -hmm. Okay, his mother's in a high-risk category. So if I were to go to their house, I'm not just looking, again, it's like STIs, right? You can't just look at the people that you're in contact with. You have to look at the people that they're in contact with. Right. Right? 
So that's really fundamentally why I think we still need to be incredibly careful. The other thing I think that people just aren't understanding is that viruses like time, right? So if we want this to stop, if we want these variants to stop happening, then it's yeah. be responsible, wear a mask, stop doing stupid shit like going to parties and, and not masking and, and not social distancing and all of those things and get vaccinated as soon as you can. Yeah. One little tip that I would like to suggest to folks is if you, and not everybody has this opportunity, but if you have the opportunity, contact your local pharmacy. If they are carrying the vaccine, they may have wait lists. So some of the pharmacies in the South have wait lists. And so, and I know this because my brother is a pharmacist. So they have a wait list of, of people who come to their pharmacy on a regular basis who may not yet have had an opportunity to schedule it because every time a new opening happens, the website crashes, right? And like yeah. the, the, you know, I think like last month, um, one of the local health departments opened up some spots for Pfizer and all 2,600 of them were taken in three hours, right? So that, so when they're going that fast, particularly if you're older, if you're not somebody who really understands how the internet works, it's right. going to be challenging or don't have access to internet, it's going to be harder for you to get access, right? So one of the things you could do is contact your local pharmacy and say, hey, can I get on the wait list? They may not allow you to if you're not still within whatever phase your state is in, but they may. And the reason is, like, for my brother, what he often does is, you know, so the Moderna vaccine has, like, 10 doses in it, right? But it, depending on how you're pulling them up, it's basically one cc that you pull up. And if you're using a three cc syringe, it's a little bit less accurate, so you don't really end up with having an extra dose. But if you actually, if your pharmacy actually has one cc syringes, you're actually very precise in what you're pulling up, and you're typically left over with one extra dose. On top of that, sometimes people no show, whether that's because they just can't come in, they've made appointments in multiple places. Train was late. Right, they no show. Right. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, my brother just starts calling people on his list. Hey, I've got a, I've got a vaccine dose. Can you get here the next hour? Right. right. Because, again, and, and the reason it's got to be can you get here in the next hour is because depending on when they open that vial, you've got six hours okay. to use that to use that vaccine. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not good. So one of the things you might want to consider if you don't have the ability to get the vaccine is contact your local pharmacy and see if you, Austin Catalano is saying, overslept, I feel personally attacked. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, you know, if you, if you have the opportunity to do that, the worst thing that's going to happen is the pharmacy is going to be like, no, you're not eligible yet. I'm sorry we can't put you on the list. Then you're no worse off than you were before. Right. Yeah. But again, the, going back to what I was saying about viruses, the thing that people that I think a lot of people aren't getting is the reason we got to keep doing this lockdown. The reason it's ridiculous that Texas is opening up, that Mississippi um, is opening up, is that when the virus has time to spread amongst unvaccinated people, that's how it has time to mutate. Right. Mm -hmm. So the quicker we get everybody vaccinated or isolated until everybody's vaccinated, the less spread that happens, the less gene reassortment that happens, the mm -hmm. less variants we end up with, right? I mean, vi this virus is doing what all viruses do. It's not like this virus is being malicious. Like a virus's job right. is to infect, replicate, <laughs> and mutate. Like that's literally yeah. its job, right? So this idea, like people say all kinds of crazy stuff. They're saying things like, like I, I just, it was very frustrated recently because someone that I know uh, posted on Facebook that someone that she knows who is vegan, eats healthy, exercises on a regular basis, meditates uh, all the time, is critically ill in the ICU. And she's very angry that people are not really following, you know, distancing rules and things like that and that they think it's a hoax. In a, in a totally separate post, this person had talked about dining out. Like, why are people eating indoors? Right. And as usual, there were people on there going, oh, you know, if you don't feel safe, you should stay inside. But, you know, it's really we should all be able to, you know, as long as we're being careful. And I'm like, there's no such thing as careful when you're indoors. That doesn't even make sense. Right. Because of how aerosols are transmitted. Right. Thank it's, you. I was hoping right? we would get to this. Right. So, again, remember, when we first started talking about the virus, we thought it was only airborne. 
And the difference between droplets. airborne, yeah. right, droplets. So the difference between airborne and aerosol is droplet size. So the, unfortunately, terminology is very confusing. But when we talk about droplets, we're talking about droplets that are large enough. They carry a ton of virus particles, and they're very heavy. So they typically don't go very far before gravity takes its course. And, and they, and they fall to the meters. ground. It's about six feet. So same thing with TB as an example, right? Tuberculosis is, is a, a droplet disease. So you got to be like more than six feet away from them. I mean, unless they're coughing up blood, right? Because then they're propelling, right? If they're coughing, they're propelling with greater force. So it's going further than six feet. Mm -hmm. But what we know is we actually know from the very first study that showed that you can transmit it indoors in restaurants. It was in China. It was a restaurant that was nearly empty, very large restaurant. One family was in one corner. Another family was in a completely other corner. One person in one family was sick. They didn't know it. Everybody in the other family got sick. Why would that be the case? Well, two reasons. It's the combination of the smaller particles, the aerosol particles. These particles are small enough that they can travel on gusts, that they can be suspended in the air temporarily. And then if you have central air or central heating, that's going to propel them, right? If you swab the air vents, uh, like in hospitals and stuff, you can actually find COVID virus. So Eating in is not, it's not a question of are you feeling unsafe and then if you feel unsafe, you should stay at home, right? Because if I decide I don't care and I'm going to go eat in a restaurant, I'm vaccinated. So sure, I could do that. But if I pick up the, if I pick up the virus and yeah. I don't have symptoms now because I'm vaccinated or I have mild symptoms and I chalk it up to allergies or a cold or something like that, yeah. I can still transmit it to other people if I'm doing other things, right? So, And there's no way to know you have it. There's no way right. to know you picked it up. Right. I mean, unless I'm just going to get an instant PCR every single day. <laughs> right, which I don't know what exist. that is, but I'm assuming that the iPhone does not provide that. No. No. I mean, you know, the, the scary thing is I did an antibody test, and it's a point-of-care test, so it's not super accurate. Point of care meaning you literally find out the answer as soon as you get as soon as you do the test, almost like a pregnancy test, right? But mm -hmm. like a pregnancy test, they're not a hundred percent accurate. So mine I did mine about five weeks after my vaccine and I definitely had a good IgG response. My brother did his about a week after the vaccine, and his actually showed a trace amount of IgM and IgG, which is what you would expect a week later. IgM is the first antibody you produce, then IgG. So his actually was consistent with what we would expect a week later. The problem yeah. is there's evidence that even the vaccine antibodies may not last long. So we may be looking at COVID vaccines yearly like we do with the flu. And part of that, again, is because we have allowed, I mean, obviously it starts with non-veganism, right? independent of that, now that it's here, we have allowed this to progress in a ridiculous fashion because we didn't lock down, we didn't mask, we didn't have federal mandates, and nobody really did except places like New Zealand and Australia, right? So these guys, one of my friends happens to be the, um, I don't know if he is anymore, but he was the deputy medical director for the state of New South Wales. Yeah. And you know, they locked down very quickly and very aggressively. And so now, any time they have pockets of breakouts, they immediately lock down again, right? But they're actually back to doing things. They're going to concerts. They're doing stuff because they did all, they took all the appropriate measures. And they did their homework. The, well, the crazy thing is they have shitheads in government there too, right? Like they're a super conservative government right now. And yet, despite their horrific stance on immigration and their horrific stance on uh, indigenous peoples and other political viewpoints, they still listened to the doctors. They still listened to the scientists, right? And then you look at New Zealand. Why can't we have a prime minister like the prime minister of New Zealand, right? I mean, she they, they were so hardcore that when one of her own government officials broke quarantine, he was demoted. He didn't just apologize. He said, I will voluntarily be demoted. Wow. Right. So, so again, I mean, that's, that's not really having anything to do with the New York uh, variant. But the problem is, is that if the New York variant is allowed to progress, 
yeah. then this vaccine was pointless in some ways. Right? I mean, not not pointless. I shouldn't say that. That's I'm misspeaking there. But it but it reminds me of I was listening to this podcast the other day on a run. It's an old podcast, but I listen to it periodically because it's one of my favorites. It's with Rich Roll and Kim Williams. Yeah. And they talk about how for many, many years, for 40 years, the rates of cardiovascular death were dropping. Okay. And then in 2017, they went up. So what was happening is for the last 40 years, we were coming up with new techniques to help people, right? We started learning how to stent arteries. We started learning, you know, roto angioplasty, right? Going in and cleaning out the blockages. We started learning preventative measures better. We started learning how to save lives after a heart attack to prevent V-fib after a heart attack. We started mm-hmm. understanding the importance of aspirin either for prevention or post um post heart attack, beta blockers, all this stuff. We started using defibrillators in people with heart failure so that we know that folks with uh, an ejection fraction below a certain number are more at risk for having arrhythmias. And so we put a little defibrillator in them so that if they have the arrhythmia, the defibrillator just shocks you back into a normal rhythm, right? And if it can't shock you back into a normal rhythm, it sends an, an urgent notification to your local doctor and or EMS or whatever, right? So despite all of that, Americans managed to basically eat their way overcoming all of these things that that they had done, right? That for 40 years, medical advancements had done. And so that's kind of what we're doing with with COVID, right? Like despite, I mean, this is historic. In a year, we came up with not one, not two, not three, not even four, because I like suspect five, that Novavax, right? I suspect Novavax is going to be really good yeah. as well, right? Mo- multiple different vaccines that are really efficacious. And despite that, our own behaviors are such that we may be making those vaccines ineffective. And that is super frustrating. Yeah. It's kind of like you said with all those preventative measures that we took for the heart disease we're using those to buy us more allowance to do whatever we want. Right. And but that's then we're managing to be interpreting but, this. But then we're managing to overcome the very things that are supposed to be protecting us. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so yeah, so that's very frustrating. I mean, I'm concerned about the New York variant because again, the vaccine protects me from a lot of things, but it doesn't, it may not protect me from the New York variant. We just don't know yet. Yeah. But if we don't know, then the answer has to be that we need to be conservative. And, and that's the only time I'll ever talk about conservative in a positive right. Right? right, is that we need to act conservatively and we need to be very careful about who we're around. Um, I, I, I hear so many people arguing against things like that, saying like, yeah, but people need to work. And yeah, but we, my, we need to open schools. I don't have a kid. Uh, maybe I don't get this, but I don't understand why children need to be in school physically in person, unless it's because the parents are like, we need daycare. But Yeah, no, I mean, I, so from my standpoint, I think this idea that, I think the argument that kids need to continue to move up grades, I think doesn't really make much sense to me. Who cares if kids lose a year, right? If they right. don't lose their lives. Right. But but there is a, a there is a good argument to be made that from a developmental standpoint, being around other children is very important to child sure. development, right? I mean, sure. I'm not talking teenagers, but I'm talking young, you know, young children, right? That is certainly important. My concern with schools has always been it's not the children. I mean, yes, there is a little bit of risk for children getting sick, but it's the adults. Right? It's the adults that are around the kids. That is my major concern. I think the challenge is that we keep arguing to go back to shitty systems, right? So we keep saying, no, kids have to go back to school because parents have to go to work. Okay, well, maybe instead of working so hard to figure out ways to get kids back to school, maybe we figure out ways to provide a universal basic income. Maybe we figure out ways to provide a safe form of daycare, if possible, um, with young people that are low risk or are vaccinated, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I'm just brainstorming, right? This is why I'm not a politician, sure. because sure. I don't know the answer. And, sure. and, you know, I don't have kids, and, but I see my niece and nephew, they're 16. They spent all of sophomore year at home. 
my sister is hardcore. Like, they don't go anywhere. Like, they go out to learn how to drive, and they go running together. They're twins. But, you know, my, um, my nephew doesn't get to play basketball anymore because he was on the basketball team. My niece was a, a long-distance runner, but they're not doing that either. So, you know, I'm sure they're sick of each other, right? But they're alive, they're healthy, and their parents are alive and healthy. So it's really important that we, we have to stop going, well, let's just go back to what we were doing before. Right. We right. have to be willing to think outside the box and say, look, if, if we have the ability to give trillions of dollars in tax cuts to billionaires, then we absolutely have the money to provide a universal basic income to people. In fact, I just posted on my Facebook page about a group called, and I'm totally going to butcher the name of it. It's like the Seed Empowerment something or other. I'm going to totally butcher it, but it was this I got pilot another phone. Program. I'm going to look at your, at your page okay. to find it. It was a pilot program where they gave people $500 a month, universal basic income. And they wanted to see what happened. And what they found was that it improved everyone's mental health. It improved job prospects. So people who had part-time jobs now had time to get full-time jobs. Right? It, it, it decreased evictions. It decreased disease processes. And then it changed... This is a shocking statistic to me. 40% of Americans, if they had an emergency that they required $400 cash, they would not have it to pay. Right. right. That's not okay in a country where people drive Bentleys and we're supposed to, you know, be able to afford iPhones that cost a lot of money. And, you know, I mean, it's... It's just, it, it's mind-boggling. I mean, it's never okay. Don't get me wrong. It's never okay that people would not be able to pay for a catastrophe. And the <laughs> only answer people seem to have to that is like, well, then you should work harder or go to school or get a better job. It's just like, yes. I mean, but that's like obviously bullshit, right? Because it completely, it completely ignores systemic racism, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think I've told you the story before, but one of my closest and dearest friends, one of my oldest and dearest friends is a family practice physician. Um, she comes from a family of like eight kids. Her parents did not, I think one of her parents finished high school and the other one did not. Okay. They never had jobs that were sort of professional jobs, well-paying jobs, anything like that. Right. Every one of her, every one of the kids in that family is a professional of some kind. One of them's like a retired ambassador. My friend is a doc. There's a couple doctors. There's a couple teachers. Um, there's a couple lawyers. So my point here is the reason I tell you that story is people will sometimes say to me, oh, your parents must have been so proud of you. You're a doctor. You're doing all these things. And it's not that my parents weren't proud of me, but my mother had a PhD. My parents came here for graduate school, mm -hmm. right? My dad had a master's in business administration. And the only reason he didn't get his doctor is because he didn't want to write a, a thesis, he finished all the coursework for it, but he's like, I'm not writing a thesis and I'm not defending it. I love that. Right? I love that. But I mean, I came in, I came from a family where literally it was drilled into me. Your job is to be a student. When I wanted to get a job in high school so I'd have money to spend, my parents were like, no, your job is to be a student. So if I, but that's because I had the privilege of being born into that family. I, I, did, I wasn't mm -hmm. born into a family that was escaping war or that yeah. was escaping drug cartels, right? So, Right. So, so this whole idea of pull yourself up by your bootstraps is only ever said by people who come from inherited wealth, in my opinion. I, I found it, by the way, and, and I'm yeah. savvy enough that I flipped the image so that it looks right <laughs> on everyone's screen. Good. SEED stands for Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration. So, so I'll check that, that out. It, it shows up as a PDF download. I'll post that. Um, I'll post a link to that. Um, I just added, if you go to the link in my bio for Honey LeBronx Instagram, the link in my bio is a link tree. And I set up six different link trees. So one link tree can be like COVID updates and it takes you to a different link tree. I just started that. So the top cool. button on my link in bio is COVID updates. Um, I posted a link to the article about the New York variant. Um, and I 
was I saying I'm going to post this? I'll post this. Yeah. I'll, I'll post this in there as well because that's useful for the argument. Um, two quick things. I know you, you're you're out of time, but we got a question here from someone. Yeah, we'll um, yeah. Uh, so we've got that question. Oh, a couple of questions. And um, in the meantime, I just want to say what you were saying about indoor dining. I found this, and I've not since found a better article than this. This will show up as backwards. Um, but about aerosol transmission, if you just Google El Pais, E-L-P-A-I-S, English, aerosols, you will get this incredible article um, about how and, and like you don't even need to read the article. You can just look at like these are people without masks in a room with no open windows. And after a, an hour or a certain number of hours, that many people got sick. All of them. One person infected. Everyone got sick. Now they try it a different way. They're like, now let's try it with everyone's wearing masks, but the door. But everyone's wearing masks and the the uh, window and the door is open. Now in this scenario. Only, uh, oh, in this scenario, I think only uh, one person got sick instead of all five of the other people getting sick. So it but shows you exactly that, how aerosols work. But the question is that one person who got sick, did they go home to an elderly parent or grandparent or a niece with a kidney transplant, right? So, so right, so this is the problem. So here's what I will say. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to dine in, if you can find a restaurant that has a negative pressure interior, and you wear an N95, sure. An actual N95, not a KN95 Correct. like we can get, but an and N95 that had medically fitted, fitted, fitted and exactly. Had fitted. Yeah. Can I just make a quick analogy? Um, I, I, again, accept retroactive applause for my glitter analogy when we're yes. talking about how this lives on surfaces, but. Think of it like cigarette smoke. For aerosol transmission, think of this as cigarette smoke. If you are at, I remember growing up in the 80s, the McDonald's, why were my parents taking us there? The McDonald's had the smoking section yep. and the non-smoking section. It was a joke. We'd sit in the non-smoking section. You were still inhaling smoke. So imagine that there's two families, a football field across from each other in an indoor restaurant, and one person is smoking you know after maybe 15, maybe 30 minutes, after a certain amount of time, that smoke will be randomly spread through all of the air. The other analogy I make is if you put a drop of red food coloring in a glass of water and did not stir it up, eventually it's still going to spread as though you stirred it up. It, that's how aerosol transmission spreads through the air, and it's randomized, and well, it goes to all places. Especially when you're talking about indoors, when yeah. you've got central heat and air, which is designed to heat or cool the entire, every corner of the building, yeah. right? So, okay. So, Vegan yeah. Paula is saying, uh, my parents have gotten fully vaccinated. Can you answer how protected they are? I mean, that, again, we can't really answer that for really anybody. We know that the um, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are about 94, 95% effective, or at least they seem to be. But again, these were before all of these variants came out. We know that there is decreased protection for some of the variants, but we don't know how decreased that protection is. Uh, they don't want to have extended visit with me until I'm vaccinated and they want masks. So I'm assuming that you mean that they want everyone to wear masks even after you're vaccinated. According to the CDC, if everybody is vaccinated, then you would not all need to wear masks. Again, that caveat is that we don't know fully yet what some of these variants are doing as far as affecting protection from the vaccine. But that's the current CDC recommendation. It just came out. I work around people in a store. Would I endanger them if I'm not vaccinated? You wouldn't. I mean, yes, if you're not wearing a mask and you're, you know, yelling or singing or doing something that's going to propel, you know, your droplets or you're touching things, you know, you're touching your mouth and then touching them. If you are wearing a mask and ideally you're double masking. Um, I've been doing that from minute one and I've just been doing that because it's common sense that the more barriers you have to mm -hmm. get through, the, the less the droplets are going to get passed around. I, I've been double masking um, since the start. Yeah. So, um, 
Well, and the other reason I double mask is I do it opposite of what's recommended. What's recommended is surgical mask on top uh, up first and then a cloth mask. I do it the opposite way. And the only reason I do that is because I sweat when I put a mask on. So the minute I sweat on a surgical mask, I lose the integrity of the surgical mask. That makes good sense. But I might want to start the, doing that. Well, no, 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 no. I would not do that because the CDC recommendation oh. is surgical yeah. first and then cloth. Okay, okay, um, okay. So what I also do is I have a mask that I can put a filter inside of. So it's actually four yeah. layers. And so the, I typically wear that one. So it's cloth, yeah. filter, filter, cloth. Um, so that's typically the one that I wear. I don't wear an N95 when I when I walk around because they're just a pain in the ass. And I always have get like, I, I really don't like the straps because the straps are super tight on them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, unless you're not being careful or unless they're not being careful, right, because then they can endanger you. You're not in any, I mean, yes, obviously the lowest risk is for you not to be around other people. But obviously people have to work. So if you're taking proper precautions, you're, you know, um, washing your hands frequently you're making sure that you don't touch things and then touch your face uh i recommend everyone wear eye protection because again any mucosal membrane and that includes your eyes if dro if a droplet gets in your eyes in theory it can infect you okay yeah all right yeah. uh i swear i'm gonna keep wanting to call austin catalano jordan catalano which is so dumb and i apologize for that um wait isn't that from my so-called life <laughs> isn't that the character <laughs> Okay, go for um, it. I'm sure he's heard no, it before. it's such a dick thing to say. I apologize because I hate when people say <laughs> stuff about my name, so I apologize. No. Okay. <laughs> yes, I also have a question as well. I hope we have time for qu Yeah, well, okay. Family members I know who have taken the vaccine have reacted to it. How can I lower my own concern with taking the vaccine? And what are the chances? I mean, you want to react to it, right? Reaction is good. It means that your immune system is working. I mean, yeah. when you say react, do you mean like, a, a severe reaction that's putting them in the hospital or anaphylaxis that's a different story if there's a family history of anaphylaxis then you need to talk to your pcp about whether you should get it but even me they made me wait 15 minutes both times after i got my vaccine and both times i was like i'm gonna freaking get covid from sitting in this waiting room with other people <laughs> for 15 minutes yeah. because i don't have a history of anaphylaxis to anything and nobody in my family does so yeah. So if you mean things like fever, myalgias, things like that, you can actually look at my, under my highlights. You'll actually see um, there's a section that says, I think it's this COVID vaccine. And I actually documented um, from, the, from when I got my uh, dose to, like, you know, when I started noticing symptoms and then how bad they got. Um, mm -hmm. but I was actually super excited. I mean, I wasn't excited to be feeling crappy, but I was excited because I was like, yay, my immune system is working. People forget that a fever is a response to something that's going on in your body. That means your immune system is trying sure. to attack something. So that's actually sure. a good sign. The one thing I will say is that current guidelines ask that we not use NSAIDs before the vaccine. That we don't like use Advil. Advil, uh, Aleve, I, basically anything that's got ibuprofen in it, anything that's like um, diclofenac. I'm trying, I mean, there's so many NSAIDs. Aspirin. Anything mm -hmm. like that, anything that's an anti-inflammatory. See, people even ideally say try not to take Tylenol. So definitely, oh. you don't you don't want to take anything in the days leading up to the dose. You don't want to take anything prophylactically, like oh, I know I'm going to get because this is like what I do with the flu, right? I know I'm going to get AP, mm -hmm. so I take some ibuprofen. Okay, yeah. you should not do that with this because in theory it can blunt your immune response, and we actually want you to have an immune response. If okay. your symptoms become uncomfortable, then the current recommendation is to try something like Tylenol, i.e. acetaminophen, over something like ibuprofen. Okay. So is there any one of those pain relievers that people can uh, default to? Is it that's just going to be the safe option? Or it kind of sounds like anything, aspirin, at you least, know, I don't, Advil? I don't really understand why the recommendation is no Tylenol, but that is the current recommendation. Avoid if you can. I mean, I did take a yeah. Tylenol once my... Um, and about 29 hours after my... So basically around 17 hours is when I really started feeling it. Yeah. Um, I, I started, you know, I was sort of achy and starting to have chills. And then I just kind of let myself deal with it all day, honestly, because I wanted to see how bad it would get. 
But by the time it was time for me to go to bed that night, so I basically got my my dose at like three in the afternoon, and then the next morning, I started to feel kind of mildly achy. But then I was also like, well, it's kind of cold in my house. Maybe that's what I'm feeling. But then over time, those symptoms just continued to get worse. And then by the time bedtime arrived, I was like, oh, no, I'm definitely starting to develop a fever. I checked my temperature. It was 100.2. That is not a fever. 100.4 is technically a fever. Um, But it was high. It was clearly an elevated temperature, and I could clearly feel it. So, uh, and more than that, it was the aches that I was having. I was just like, I'm not going to be able to go to sleep. So... I took a gram of Tylenol, and an hour later, I was like, I've never done drugs, but I was like, this must be what feeling stoned feels like, because I just felt <laughs> phenomenal. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, uh, so you know, and I only did that because I really just did not feel well enough to, like, get a good night's sleep. Yeah. All right, so I hope this doesn't seem like a silly question, but can it spread like cigarette smoke? There are times when I'm walking outside. I mean... Sure, if they're sick, yes. Like, if someone is smoking and they blow smoke in your face, they're blowing droplets in your face, too, right? So if they're infected, yes, they can. The main thing to remember is, I don't want people to, like, panic and be paranoid. We know that it seems to be that illness, the degree of illness is not only affected by what your comorbid conditions are, like, do you have type 2 diabetes or hypertension or things like that, but it also seems to be affected by your inoculation dose. So if Mm -hmm. I'm running on the trail and someone's running past me and they're breathing hard and I'm breathing hard and they have COVID, but they don't know it and they breathe on me and I inhale a couple droplets, I'm less likely to get severely ill. But if we both stop and start talking to each other and we're both huffing and puffing and this guy's huffing in my face for 15 Mm -hmm. straight minutes, then I've mm-hmm. gotten a decent dose, right? I've gotten a decent load of it. Um, yeah. And then I'm much more likely to be sick. Yeah. My mom took Tylenol after vaccine with a 99.4 temp and some muscle aches. I normally wait for a higher fever. Yeah, so again, 99.4 is not a fever. We, don't, we do not consider that a fever. Should she have taken it? Did she mess up immune response and effectiveness? There's no way for me to know that because the immune system, I mean, I know people who've gotten both vaccines, had symptoms, got antibody tested and had no antibodies. That's incredibly rare. They just did not respond to the vaccine. I also know people who had zero symptoms, sailed through it, freaked out, thought there's no way that I could have antibodies and had a huge antibody response, right? The immune system, I mean, back from my lung transplant days, I've known this, right? So I know people who get lung transplants who don't do anything we tell them to do. They're non adherent with their medications. They do whatever the hell they wanna do. They go back to smoking and they'll live 10 years with a lung transplant. And then I'll know somebody who religiously does everything we tell them to do. They don't go to buffets. They wash their hands. They wear masks everywhere. They take all their meds. They never have a single episode of rejection. And then they die two years later from chronic rejection. We just don't know enough about the immune system in general to fully understand. And again, this virus is so new that we're still gathering information. I would not Mm -hmm. assume that she uh, did not have a response. I mean, she clearly had some sort of immune response. She had muscle aches. Yeah. And I had the, uh, I got my first shot of the Madonna vaccine uh, two week, a week ago. Did Friday. you just say the Madonna vaccine? That's what I'm going with. I'm calling it the Madonna <laughs> vaccine. Okay. Um, and I had nothing. I, I didn't have a headache. My arm didn't hurt. And like, I know what you said. You're like, fine, great, whatever. But like, I was worried because I'm like, I want confirmation for my body. Remember. Remember, so it's a little bit weird that you didn't have any muscle pain, like local muscle pain. But I mean, I, I didn't touch it, and that's because if I touched it, it hurt from getting yeah. the shot. But it wasn't it, it wasn't anything that hurt unless I, like, started okay. poking at okay. it. Yeah. yeah. So remember, though, most studies have shown that it's the second dose when yeah. you get the response, right? Yeah. Um, like, I didn't have any symptoms with the first. Um, that's not true. I mean, I had local deltoid pain like I do when I, when I take a tetanus shot. It hurt for me to lift my arm. The second yeah. shot was really weird. I had no pain when I lifted my arm. I only had severe pain if I touched the spot. Um, uh. But, like, not a lot of swelling or anything that caused me, like, if I, if I lifted my arm, I had no pain. But, you know, then I did have the other symptoms. So Someone's asking if her parents should get antibody tested. I'm assuming she means to find out if the vaccine worked. And I'm hearing that, that, that there's no need for that. 
Well, uh, so I'm going to say I don't feel comfortable answering that because I don't really want to be giving, like, medical advice over the Internet, right? I will. It's fine. You don't have to. I'm kidding. (laughs) But if there is a concern, your parents should send a message to their primary care doctors with this exact question, right? Yeah. And they can help answer that question for whether or not they feel they should. There's arguments to be made for and against. Um, the, certainly the point of care test that I did is not as accurate as getting a serum blood test is. Meaning, like right, when you right, go to the right. lab and you actually have a blood draw, right? I had the kind yeah. that it's, it's kind of like if you do a diabetes test, right? They test your blood and then they put a like drop quick, on a like little the thing. Quick, like the rapid tests, you know, for yeah. other things. Yeah. 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 Where like a blood so, confirmation is more, was more accurate. Right. Well, and I actually texted my friend Anish uh, Mehta, the the chief of infectious disease at Emory, and I was all, oh, look at my response. This is great, right? He's like, I don't know if that's all that great. It's a point of care test. It's not as accurate. Um, And there's some, I mean, although I looked up the specific brand, the brand pamphlet says that it's specific only to SARS-CoV-2. The challenge, though, is it's it tests for antibodies against either the spike protein or the neuramidase protein. So the N protein mm-hmm. or the S protein. So the N protein, you can only get antibodies to if you've actually been exposed to the disease, right? So it, so this vaccine does not actually tell me technically if I responded to vaccine. It just tells mm-hmm. me that I have antibody. You're right, and, you're right. and depending on how honest the company is, which who the hell knows how honest they were, right? It may not tell me anything other than I reacted to a coronavirus. It may not even tell me that I reacted to specifically SARS-CoV-2, right? They claim that it is specific to SARS-CoV-2, but, like, I haven't seen the source data on this, right? Yeah. So... So, yeah, so so I don't, I mean, I did it mostly out of curiosity. Like, I did it just because I'm a geek and I wanted to see what it would look like, right? Um, it, I, you know, I'm not hanging my hat on that. To me, the, the larger um, indication is that I had an immune response to it. Uh, uh, can I just ask, as long yeah. as we still have you, for people who want to stay tuned for updates, um, cause like I didn't hear about this, uh, NYC strain because you and I are in touch. I heard about this immediately from you. Where would you recommend that like the lay person can stay tuned to for these kind of updates, which they'll then understand without having to have a medical degree, but to also you know, be like on the cutting edge and like up, you know, up to the minute updates like this. So I would say follow Carlos Del Rio and Anish Mehta mm-hmm. on Twitter and yeah. I think when you and I did our first update together, you put their Twitter accounts in the I show have, notes. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I think and I turn on notifications for them yeah, so that if yes. they do, uh, it comes to my phone like a text. Yes. Well, the other thing I was going to say is the only reason I know about it is because I periodically I haven't set a Google alert because Google alerts drive me crazy and then I'll get seven thousand emails from them. Right. Right. But I will every morning literally Google Fauci. And, you know, see what other interview he's given, what other interview Anthony Mm -hmm. Fauci has given. And that's how I found out about the New York variant. Yeah. Right. So you could set a Google alert to Anthony Fauci. Right. Um, Because he is going to be the go to person that everyone is going to ask. Okay. All right. Good. I'm going to put those also in my link tree. Uh, which I created for COVID updates. So if you look here, if you go to Honey LeBronx's link in bio and click on that, the top button says COVID updates. That will take you here. The top is the article about the NYC variant. This is just talking about aerosol transmission, so you can better get an idea of how that works. And that's the PDF about universal basic income and how that can actually help people get through things like this. But I'm also going to add to this just um, a a list of um, people who I recommend that they follow. Yeah. I mean, so that'll be Fauci and Meta and um, and Del Rio. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Del Rio in particular um, tends to be. Pro- I mean, not that Anish is not prolific, but I think Del Rio tends to post a little bit more than he does. Okay, okay, good, good. I mean, another, yeah, I see another Carlos person, Del Rio all the time on my. Yeah. Uh, he's constantly. Yeah. Another person would be Colleen Kraft. K-R-A-F-T. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of them out there, so it's the one that goes to the one that is an Emory doctor. Colleen Craft at Emory. Yeah, I remember there was like two of these people who I yeah. tagged them and you're like, that's the wrong person. Right yeah. name, wrong person. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, same with Anish. I mean, Anish is a pretty common Hindu name, and so is Metta. So, um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just very weird to me because I actually know all of them. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Colleen was a couple years below me in residency. Um, Anish was actually my resident when I was a fellow. Um, Carlos was my, what, was my faculty mentor when I was an intern. So, <laughs> you know. Wow. Um, it's, I love seeing them, you know, get all, all of these all this fame and accolades because they're brilliant and and to me it's just as just what they have to say so oh you cut out sorry i went out there for a second okay. my phone is yeah, yeah. about to die okay um, so i was just going to say the reason i trust them is because i know them as human beings and i i i mean these are not guys that are motivated by money these are not guys i mean if you're motivated by money you're not going into id Right, <laughs> these doctors do not get paid that much, and they yeah. certainly don't get paid that much in academia. So, yeah, you know, so they're not motivated by that kind of thing. Um, infectious disease doctors, hands down, are going to be the geekiest, nerdiest people in the room. <laughs> the um, yeah, the, their attention, their attention to detail. Like, there's a joke in medicine that if you're a resident and you're coming on a service and you're new to the service and there's someone on your service who's been there for like six months, they've been in the hospital for like six months. And the person who leave, the person signing off and handing the patients over to you usually writes like a summary note, but it's not going to be very detailed, right? They're going to, they're going to hit the highlights and you want to know everything that happened to them, call an ID consult. Cause the ID docs will come in there and they will literally give you a 12 page document of everything that's ever happened to that doctor, I mean, to that patient, yeah. and they'll do the work for you. They're just very detail-oriented, very, very smart. Um, and because they work in infectious disease, they're very kind and non-judgmental, right? You can't be someone working on the forefront of hepatitis C and HIV and things like that and be a judgmental person. Right. So just one aside I want to throw in there really quick for people. I know, I know that we're dealing with all these people who are so distrustful of medicine. It meant so much to me when you told me, if this is okay to say, about the Uber driving situation, how like there are doctors out there who are oh, yeah. working as Uber drivers because they're not making enough doing this kind of work. Well, what's happened, sorry, I just want to make sure that like my boss isn't trying to get in touch with me. Okay, sure, okay. sure, yeah, absolutely. No, so, um, no, what happened with that particular person is that I think what a lot of people aren't realizing is that hospital systems are using COVID and the fact that they're losing money to cut pay for physicians, to lay off physicians, to fire mm -hmm. physicians. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I know a physician who lost his job and is driving Uber now um, because of the pandemic. So. It's very, very hard for me to hear people still propagate things like, oh, well, doctors just write COVID as the cause of death for anything. I mean, as an ICU doctor who's filled out an incredible number of death certificates, that's really offensive to me. It would never occur to me to lie on a legal document. I, there's no reason to have an agenda. There's nothing that a physician gains from amplifying a pandemic. There's no, I mean, how, we are the ones that are like, we're locking down aggressively, we're hiding from our families, we're living in the garage, right? Why would we do any, like, what would be our motivation to fake a pandemic that would then require us to do all of this stuff, right? Yeah. We like to go out to eat, we like to travel, right? You know, why, why would we create a hoax that would yeah. force us to not be able to do those things? I mean, that's just, there's nothing about this cognitive dissonance that makes any sense, right? Uh, and, and as far as for people to follow, just so I know if I have the right one, I'm looking for Anish Mehta. It's um, Anish and K. Mehta. That, okay, it, that's yeah. the one. All right, great, yeah. found him. So I, I'm, I'm making, uh, as we talk, I'm making a Google Doc, so I'm going to have that link. Like okay. Within minutes, I'll have that link in there as well. And I'm surprised I'm not already following him, so I'm following him now with notifications on. Oh, and Colleen S. Craft pops up as well. Um, there's, and a I couple, wasn't... there's a couple people that they retweet frequently, and I'm totally blanking on their names. They're ID physicians at other um, academic centers. So if yeah. you notice that they're retweeting certain people, you may want to consider following them as well. I'm, not, I'm just not on Twitter all that often. Um, sure. 
and I really try to keep my Twitter and my Instagram, I really tried to keep both of them just about plant-based diets and that's failed. So yeah. <laughs> now I'm posting a little bit of everything. So It's um, Colleen S. Craft um, from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, who, uh, 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 ID doc, um, right? Yeah. Infectious disease doctor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, so yep that's her. That, that's her, yep. Yep, that's Colleen. Okay, great. So I've got all of them, and that will also be in the um, link tree COVID updates. I'll have a doc uh, in there for people to follow for uh, for updates. All right. Um, I don't know if there's anything that we didn't answer. Um, I know you got to run, but just yeah. one last quick question. How, how safe would you say it is for either bar goers, patrons, audience members, or drag queens performing to go to an indoor bar and watch a drag show on stage, but it's okay because the drag queen has one of those plastic face sneeze guards or this two-inch ribbon of clear plastic just in front of their mouth. How safe is that? So I will tell you, I went to an outdoor performance of mm -hmm. the opera, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, these are folks that are projecting, and every time they sang, every single time they sang, they were literally enclosed in plastic. And the stage was like 12 feet away. And do you know why I agreed to go to that performance? Because Carlos Del Rio is the guy who helped them plan how to do this. Thank right? you. <laughs> I love that. It was the Atlanta Opera. But in your scenario, there's a couple problems. Mm -hmm. That face shield, in theory, provides some protection, but there's no mask. A plastic right. sheet over here, I don't really know what that does. I don't know how porous that plastic is. Right. I mean, is that a semi permeable membrane, in which case it's pointless? You might as well put a potato peel over your face, which is also a semi permeable membrane. Right. And delicious. So, right. So, like, I have no idea if, you know, the if you look at the size of a droplet, right, mm -hmm. it's a nanomicron. You know, it's it's not something, you know, I have no idea what the size of the holes in the. I mean, we we think the plastic is solid, but if you put that under a microscope, it's not solid, right? Right, right. So, so yeah, and then again, eyes aren't covered in that second scenario, right? Uh -huh. And then the patrons in the bar, I'm always nervous whenever alcohol is being served anywhere because it lowers inhibitions, which means it lowers judgment, right? Yeah, and from the videos I'm seeing of people posting at these shows on their Instagram stories, all of you, um, they're, the, the patrons are sitting there in the bar unmasked because they're like, oh, well, I'm six feet away from the drag queen. Well, you're not when she comes and takes your tip out of your hand. But also again, and aerosol doors. transmission. Right. right. So I think, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize this, but when we're in training, when we ask a, a, a patient if they have a history of alcohol or drug abuse, do mm -hmm. you know that that triggers us immediately to ask a sexual health history? I can I can see why I can imagine why because when you are under the influence of alcohol or drugs I should say alcohol or other drugs alcohol is a drug let's face it mm -hmm. right. um, you don't have the capability oftentimes to make good decisions right yeah. you're much more likely to lower your inhibitions and have unprotected sex or mm -hmm. share a needle right so so again similarly those are just not it's really hard. It's really hard for me to see that. Um, if, if I was already not taking a sabbatical from ICU work, this would make me just throw up my hands and be like, screw it. Why would I risk my life for people? To be clear, this is a doctor responding to what I'm describing seeing on people's Instagram stories with drag queens performing indoors and people going to shows and, and only those measures being taken. And let me be clear, I risk my life in an ICU all the time, on the floor all the time. I have brought mm -hmm. people with tuberculosis to prove they had TB. And the rate of transmission of TB in a Bronx suite is incredibly high, right? So I, if I can help a patient out, then I'm going to do that. But it's very yeah. hard to watch people do things knowingly that are harming other people and then also making our lives harder because it's causing this influx of patients. It's causing this overload of resources, right? 
And one thing that you told me earlier is that, like, as a result of this, a lot of doctors, like, like, I don't know what the term would be, but like doctors who like work in these situations with patients are starting to like not go to school for that. They're like, is there a different area of medicine I can go into, which uh, is not putting me and my family at risk and which is not so like well, subject not, to debate and. I mean, it's not just that existing physicians are making exit plans. Right. The Thank you, of, everyone. The, the rate of burnout amongst critical care physicians was high before this happened. Right. I mean, that's why I took a sabbatical because I was burnt out. Yeah. So, so now you add in this pandemic that didn't have to be this bad. Right. On top of that, a mistrusting public that's accusing you literally of doing things that you have no reason to do that would literally violate the very oath you take when you become a doctor. Yeah. Right. Doing things that make your life harder, threaten, threaten your life and threaten your loved one's lives. Yeah. Right? I know. So, so I'm in a lot of Facebook groups for like physician side gigs and things like that. And the number of people looking for an exit strategy in medicine has gone up astronomically. So I think there's going to be a reckoning. So we're approaching a day where potentially these people who we are currently counting on and leaning on to save our lives, they're just not going to, we're not going to have as many of them to yeah, count so on. You're, so you're going to have new people, you're going to have less qualified people, less well-trained people. Yeah. So, and, 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 and I mean, I don't want to blame individuals because like, I know that we don't have like, uh, the alternative for some people is like, like, well, should I stay home and starve? Cause I have no money to feed my, this is why we need a, a universal basic income. This is why we need a government to, to take care of us and not abandon us. But, but by that, say, you know, the things that I'm angry about currently. So on the other hand, so when I take this and show right, this to people, people, but the people who are yeah. going to bars, come on. I, I, I get that psychologically, socially, they're like, I just need this, whatever. But it's like, I need that too. But I'm doing what I'm supposed to do so we can all have that sooner. Right. And, and, and also to all the people on Grindr and Scruff and all the hookup apps who are advertising in their profiles like fully vaxxed, that does not mean it's safe for you to do anything that we were advised not to do during this last year. Hooking up, having parties, having friends over, doing all the other risky things that we know we're doing, or traveling to Miami or Puerto Vallarta. None so, of that uh, is so safe. I just want to say one thing, and then I, and then I should go. It's just yeah, really yeah, yeah. especially gross to me that people are traveling to other countries to party because it is the epitome of white supremacy. Yeah. To go to another country like Mexico. I have colleagues and friends in Mexico who are in lockdown themselves. Can't go out. They can't get the vaccine because the government hasn't decided, are they going to do Sputnik? Are they going to do Pfizer? What are they going to do? Right? Yeah. They can't get the vaccine and be safe. And here's a bunch of usually white people showing up from America to party and increase their risk, the local populations, mm -hmm. in places that mm -hmm. don't have the infrastructure we do, that don't have the hospital capabilities that we do. It's just absolutely disgusting, for lack of a better term. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you oh, yeah. so much for yeah. doing this today. And uh, I'm going to make sure to share this far and wide so that this can reach people because I think this is a really needed, concise update. And um, I'm posting a new episode of Big Fat Vegan Radio today. And uh, I was hoping I could get an update with you, but I'm, I think I'm just going to take this and put okay. it in the episode um, as a separate uh, episode, as, a, as, a, as its own update. Okay, sounds good. Awesome. All right, thank, thank you again you. so much. Happy you birthday. too. Oh, thank you so much. International Women's Day yes. and Colleen Patrick Goudreau's birthday as well. Oh, nice. Okay. I'll yeah. Happy birthday. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank Bye. you again for the update. I really appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, I hope everyone had a chance to check that out. Um, I have spoken with Dr. Nike um, many, many times. If you want to hear any of that, some of it's a little bit dated. You're very welcome. And help me thank her for that as well. Um, by the way, if you want to thank her 
there's a couple of ways you can thank her. And I know that she would request these things. One would be if you Google, it's in Atlanta, there's an organization called Vegan Meals That Heal. It's, um, I think it's, oh, thank you, Stephen. It's my birthday. Um, Vegan Meals That Heal is like a black run uh, organization for uh, just getting vegan food, like healthy, whole foods, plant-based vegan food to people in the community who are experiencing food insecurity, people who I think who are experiencing homelessness, um, people who just need the healing that can come from having a meal um, and getting good, healthy food to them. So if you want to thank her for that, donate a dollar or five or, 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 or ten to Vegan Meals That Heal, or also I know her good friend, uh, who I've also interviewed as well, um, Dr. Aisha Akhtar, um, if you donate to, she has an organization, I'm looking it up right now on, thank you, happy birthday, um, I'm looking it up on my site because she mentioned them in the most recent episode. Um, she basically said, if this episode made a difference for you and you wanna, uh, you wanna thank her, you can also donate to, uh, this is Dr. Aisha Akhtar's organization that she works with. She, I interviewed about the link between pandemics and how all of these pandemics are caused by animal agriculture. Yes, Contemporary for, uh, the Center for Contemporary Sciences, um, and they are at contemporarysciences.org. They are working to like to phase out animal testing which is its own whole thing that keeps setting us decades and decades back scientifically so um they are working to develop alternatives to that and to move us away and shift that paradigm so those are two wonderful ways that you can say thank you i know she'd appreciate that so i'm going to go ahead and post that as um an episode um, on uh, Big Fat Vegan Radio. I'm also posting an episode from my friend Jeff Monis um, about the sort of uh, conspiracy theorists and conspiracy theories in general and the link between that and COVID. He does a wonderful breakdown of that, which we recorded like five, six months ago, and I'm sorry I haven't posted, but I will post it like within the next 24 hours. And this one is a separate episode, so you have them both to listen to, um, probably back to back. Um, so if there's anyone in the meantime who has any additional questions, um, I am not a doctor, but I once worked in a photo lab at a Walgreens and they would occasionally pull me and put me in the pharmacy to read the doctor's notes and decipher their handwriting and then type up the um, instructions on the prescriptions with no real schooling or training they just take it's okay because the pharmacist checks them before they're finalized but like i was the one having to say take one tablet orally per day with food but i'm deciphering that from like tk1 tb po po means by mouth orally who knew um but uh uh, uh, I, when I worked in the pharmacy lab, just because I'm such a good person, I gave medical advice to anyone who came to the window asking questions. I only did it once, and then the pharmacist ran over and they're like, are you giving medical advice? And I'm like, no, oh, I'm just telling her, you know, the zinc lodges. And she's like, don't give medical advice. And it hit me in that moment. I was like, oh, right, because I'm not trained. Oh, okay. So, um, but with that said, if anyone has any leftover questions that didn't get answered or wants me to clarify anything that we went over, um, I, I, I think I might be able to do a decent job of just re-explaining what we discussed or, or answering from a previous answer that I uh, got from Dr. Nike on a previous uh, interview that we've done. Um, but um, since no one's asking those questions, I'm going to assume that all questions have been answered. Stephen Conrad Moore, I uh, love you. And I also love that, like, you're one of my friends now who's like, verified checkmark, Stephen Conrad Moore. You better work. Um, so I'm just scrolling back through the comments really quickly to, um, to see any comments that we have. Um, Vegan Hala, I have a coworker who is about to take vacation and go to Miami. I hope she doesn't bring the virus back. There's just no good reason for her. I mean, uh, if it's a vacation, I mean, get a, spend that money on a VR headset. And then you can go anywhere. You're welcome. Look at me answering life coach here. 
Um, there's no reason. There's no good reason. And when people talk about mental health, I appreciate that. But can we stop using mental health as a wedge issue against public health guidelines? People, people keep talking about, like, yeah, but the rate of suicides is going to go up from people being in isolation. I get that, and I don't want to discount that. That's important, too. But it's not going to be 500,000 people taking their lives because we're on lockdown and isolation. So if lockdown and isolation is the problem, let's shorten the amount of time that we have to do that. We all got this news in March. We all knew by the end of March, let's say by April 1st, we all knew what had to be done. Lockdown for eight weeks. That's two and a half months. The month of April, the month of May, let's even say the whole month of June. By July 1st, we all could have been going about our lives. We all could have been enjoying summer. We all could be on one big party bus down to Miami together. We could have been done with this. So if we're really concerned about people committing suicide and people's mental health, then you know what? We would have done or should have done what we were told to do so that we can shorten the amount of time we will all have to deal with this. So there's that. And listen, if you're a drag queen, I appreciate the hustle, but get the fuck creative. Get creative. Find another way other than having to go into a bar and perform in person, breathing the same air as people are breathing around you. And you know what? Like, I get it. I get it. That's difficult. We might, um, I might be wondering one other thing. I'll read that in one second. But I get it. I get it. We're scared. We don't know what to do. But and I'm just going to say it, and this is going to sound hippy-dippy bullshit, but I'm saying, and I'm not saying this like this is true. I'm saying this like, Standing in this possibility, what is now possible that wasn't possible before? And that possibility is you may just have to get willing to make bold requests of people. You might have to be willing to make bold requests and deal with someone telling you no. And then be willing to ask again and learn to endure no learn to endure hearing no i have made some bold requests during this time that have allowed me to survive and have made it possible for me to stay home and not have to worry about my survival that is not necessarily because I'm privileged, though I am a white cis male in North America. Privilege will always play into everything I ever accomplish or have. I'm not saying otherwise. But it's because the reason I'm able to feed myself and keep a roof over my head is because of the bold requests I made of people and organizations and institutions. And because I've done that work... I know I can weather this storm and keep myself safe and more importantly, keep everyone else safe. So be creative and pair that creativity with a willingness to make bold requests of people. For everyone who's like, no, but I need to survive. I need to go back into this bar and I need this gig, girl. How many people have you asked, hey, would you be willing to sponsor me for 50 bucks a month? So I can get through this. Thank you, Stephen. Can you sponsor me? Can you sponsor a drag queen for just the price of a cup of coffee? I'm, I'm kidding and I'm not kidding. But like the, the joke here is use your creativity. Flex your creativity on this. Flex your creativity in this direction. Find a creative way to survive this. That will set an example for people so they realize, oh, right, I don't have to put myself and other people at risk to survive this. I, necessity is the mother of all invention. And we have seen so many people get creative and invent new. There are whole new ways of doing drag, not only that can transcend time and space. You, you can miss my entire show. 
You can eat. I don't even need these anymore because I'm not on the phone. You can miss my entire show. You can be in a whole different country where my show happens, and you can still come back and watch my show. I don't have a show going on right now. Well, actually, I do. I have a play, and I'll speak to that in a second. That's actually another way I've been surviving is selling tickets to my play online. But I have friends who are, like, permanently disabled, and, like, it's just not an option for them to be like, I'm going to go out and go to a drag show. And that does not mean they stopped loving drag. And, and let's face it, drag isn't just about loving drag, it's about needing drag. For many of us, talking about mental health, for people who are bedridden or live with mobility issues, this has been an opportunity for them to get to have gatherings virtually, to get to go to drag shows that are tailored to a virtual audience. Even DragCon made a virtual DragCon. Was it as good as being at DragCon in person? Maybe not, but you know what? It kept me company for a couple of days on the couch. So use your creativity and pair that with the care you have for your fellow Earthlings. And let's all get through this. Um, with that said, I may as well make one last segue, and, uh, and I guess then we're going to start... Um, uh, someone named Bar Boy Baby, I can only assume that you are someone who may also be spending some of your time or career in bars, whether you're a performer or a bartender, and if you heard everything that I just said, like, listen, I apologize that it's difficult to hear, and if you didn't hear, go back and re-listen to it, but, like, now is not the time to be performing in bars. If you live in San Diego or Sacramento and you're doing fierce outdoor shows, great, good for you. And also, like, listen, wear a mask still. Just draw makeup on it, right? Now is the time where, Valentina, we don't need to see your lips. Again, get creative. I want, and I'm not gonna give away, I guess I am gonna give away this entire idea. This is not how I thought I'd be spending my birthday. I, I, I once had an idea. I was talking to Bob, and I said, what if I did a drag number that's like, I'm not... Actually, if, don't Google this, because it's it's not for children. It's not safe for work. But if you YouTube um, Honey LeBronx Fruit Salad, it's not... It's mo you will never be able to unsee it, and it is vile and disgusting, and I refuse to apologize. So just, if you think you don't want to see it, you don't want to see it. But it's a number I once did um, that is it's a very legendary. I did it, I think, nine years ago, and it's still talked about to this day. But I didn't lip sync. I didn't sing. I didn't, I didn't, there were no, I, there were lyrics. I did, in the number, I am just doing, I'm just m moving through the number. I'm doing things while this song is playing. And I once joked about, like, what if I did a number where I come out on stage, and now, like, everything that I'm voicing over on the number is just like, oh, God, everyone's looking at me. Like, do they, like, are they expecting me to dance? Maybe if I just sit here quietly, maybe people will just start tipping me for no reason. And, like, the whole number was my inner thoughts um, and uh, Dr. Mike is, uh, is looking to join again. So the whole number was my inner thoughts. And it's just like, that's a great creative way to not need to lip sync. Get creative. Uh, let me uh, bring her on back on. I think it's working. I think it's working. Did I do that right? Are we back? Hi. Hey, welcome back. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. So I just wanted to join very quickly because I saw... And I can only see you from here up. Oh, sorry. There sorry. we go. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm taking a tiny break. I'm sitting on my bed. Um, yeah. Did you used to call these things husbands? That's what I grew up calling these things. Husbands? Yeah, the pillows that have like the arms on the side. Is that just a southern thing? I've never heard that in my life. That's so cute. Yeah, that's what they were called. I mean, it's cute, but also kind of patriarchal. It's not very well, so. sure. I, um, yeah, I actually have a, 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 a pile of, this is not pillows. This is memory foam mattress topper. I cut up into eight large pillows. And um, I'm planning on shredding them and making shredded memory foam pillows. And I'm going to make a body pillow, two of them. So I have one to spoon and then like one to snuggle behind me. So like I am literally building a memory foam husband to snuggle nice. with. Nice. Yeah. Like I said, get creative, you there know? You go. So, so weather so, the storm. So yeah. the reason I 
wanted to just jump in is I saw that Vegan Kala had that comment about pharmaceutical companies and the yeah. vaccine. And so I just want to say, you know, and the caveat to this is I'm not a fan of pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I'm just going to put that out there. I'm not a fan of pharmaceutical companies, mostly because they make billions of dollars in profit a year. And they still argue that they should continue to do that because it costs them like one or two billion to develop a drug. Mm -hmm. Right. If it costs you one or two billion to develop a drug and you make five to ten billion a year after like year two, you can stop being a jerk and like lower the price of your drug. Yeah. Right. So so that frustrates me. It also frustrates me that um, they will charge a different cost for HIV medications in Africa than they will in Europe. And sometimes it's higher in Africa. Right. So anyway, those are many, there are many reasons why I don't like pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. However, what I think people don't understand about vaccines is Typically, pharmaceutical companies and physicians don't make a lot of money on vaccines. In fact, most primary care doctors lose money on vaccines because of the equipment that you need to have to store it, the resources you need to document and to give out the vaccines. The billing reimbursement for it is like shit. So they're not really making money off it. When it comes to this particular vaccine, there's a couple differences with this, with all of these vaccines. And I'm going to sp speak most specifically about Pfizer and Moderna because uh, those are the ones that I know better than the others. Okay, But typically, you know, you'll have a phase one trial, a phase two trial, a phase three and a phase four. And phase one and two are often safety trials. So it might only have 10, 50, 100 patients in those trials. Right. Uh, usually a phase one trial is also a dose trial. Right. Like what's the dose that we should be giving to show efficacy. Okay, great, so now mm -hmm. we've established that. Now we're gonna move on and we're gonna use that dose that we think is the right dose and we're gonna do it to more people to make sure that not only is it still efficacious but that we're not seeing a lot of side effects, right? Mm -hmm. Then phase three and phase four trials are different. So phase four is after the drug has gone to market typically. Phase three, typically a large phase three trial is gonna be like 3,000 patients, 8,000 patients. Mm -hmm. Moderna and Pfizer each had 30,000 and 40,000 in them, right? So, and, and it wasn't that like half were placebo, half were the vaccine. Often these were one to, well, I think it was like a one to two and a one to three to one of them. So in other words, it was like 20,000 in one group got the vaccine. I just got a weird, sorry. I. Oh, you broke up for a second. You said. got a weird cat. Yeah, sorry, I got a weird calendar alert for something. Okay, anyway, you said so, even if 20,000 or so get the vaccine. Right, so about 20,000 20, or so in one trial got the vaccine, and then another 20,000 or so got it in the other one. That's unheard mm -hmm. of. So we never, ever have this kind of data, safety data, on vaccines. But I want you to pay attention to what was done right after the vaccines were given, right? So mm -hmm. in those trials, nobody had anaphylaxis. That's not unusual to have happened because typically the people that sign up for vaccine trials are healthy. They don't typically have a lot of medical issues, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when to, once you get it out into the population, you may see side effects that you would not see normally in a trial, right? Because now you're not just giving it to healthy people, right? <laughs> The very point of the drug is to give it to people that are unhealthy, people that have other comorbid conditions, right? So as far as the anaphylaxis goes, everyone's pointed to that, like, see, this is why it's unsafe. No, the people that had anaphylaxis to it have known anaphylaxis issues. And it turns out they were reacting to the pegylated, I think it was, I think it's the pe pegylated gly glyco something or other. There's a specific ingredient in it that many of them are reacting to. But I want you mm -hmm. to pay attention to what was, d what was done in response to that. Now all of us have to be monitored for 15 minutes. Talk about overkill in a good way. Yeah. Right? So I, I can't tell you that the pharmaceutical companies aren't going to make a ton of money off this. We know they are because the government paid them a bunch of money to develop the drug and then paid them a bunch of money again to buy the drug. Right? What I can tell you is when you, we think of it as, ooh, big bad pharma, right? 
Do you know who participated in the Emory, uh, I mean, in the vaccine trials? The Emory docs did. So people like Dr. Mehta and Dr. Kraft and another uh, physician that I know that was a couple years below me in training, Dr. Nadine Rufel, right? Mm -hmm. Again, these are people that practice with integrity. They're not going to fake data or report false data because, again, they don't have an agenda. They want to, if this vaccine is not efficacious, they want to know that, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and typically for the Pfizer and Moderna, most of these are going to be large academic centers that are doing this. I mean, is it an ideal system? Of course it's not an ideal system, right? There's always, anytime money is involved, you always run the risk that something could go wrong, that somebody might practice in, in an unethical way, right? But I can tell you that the people that I trust who've looked at the data and looked at the source data, when they tell me it's safe, I'm going to take the vaccine. Yeah. And yeah. as I said, I've taken the vaccine. You know, so it's it was, it, from my standpoint, let's, for argument's sake, say that there are side effects that we don't really know about. I think what people don't really understand about vaccines are, particularly the mRNA vaccines, if you're going to have a side effect, you're, you're going to have that side effect within, like, weeks. Right? Typically about six weeks out is the latest that you can potentially have Guillain-Barre. But after that, you, you have no mRNA in your system anymore, so you can't really have a reaction to it. Right? So I think what people are not understanding is they're not seeing the flip side. They don't know what it's like to be in an ICU full of people with ARDS, people who've been on a vent for 30 days, and if they happen to survive it, will be permanently disabled. They'll be what mm -hmm. we call a pulmonary cripple because they'll have scarring in their lungs. They'll be on oxygen. Yeah. The 28-day mortality for ARDS is lower than the one-year mortality. The one-year mortality is higher for ARDS than the 28-day. That means even if you survive your hospital stay, you still have a really good chance, a better chance that you will die by the end of year one than you had of surviving to day 28, okay? If you survive and mm -hmm. you've been on the vent that long, you're likely to be very debilitated, right? Use it or lose it. Your muscles are atrophied. Mm -hmm. You may have critical illness neuropathy or critical illness myopathy, okay? You may have ICU delirium. You will most likely have some degree of PTSD. ICU delirium, is that just going crazy from being in there for too long? Yeah, yeah. It has to do with the fact that your circadian rhythms are all jacked up because you don't have oh, light, you don't have light yeah. dark stimulus properly. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Then, and then when you're in an ICU, you can't sleep at night. Why? Because the freaking alarms are going off, either in your yeah. room or the room next door. There's yeah. a code that's happening every 20 minutes, right? So, so not only do staff have PTSD from being in an ICU, but patients have PTSD. Survivors yeah. of ARDS have, have PTSD. So let me tell you, if I had to choose between, I mean, I don't even, I can't even think Guillain-Barre or Bell's palsy, right? Mm -hmm. If I had to choose between those options and having ARDS, having a stroke, having a heart failure requiring a, a transplant, having a pulmonary embolus, uh, being on uh, oxygen for the rest of my life, going to rehab for six months because of a polyneuropathy or a myopathy, having delirium, having sort of that long COVID brain fog, right? Because we know that the COVID virus can lay dormant in your brain for quite some time and then just sort of reactivate, right? Yeah. A sort of being a ticking time bomb. I'm going to pick vaccine side effects every single time. So I, 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 yeah. Sorry, I'm just looking at this question. Since the vaccine doesn't stop you from yeah. getting or spreading COVID-19, what is the point of air travel wanting proof? Because it decreases the chance that you are going to give it to someone who can then die of it. Right? It decreases your risk of death or, or severe disability. So that's why airlines are probably moving towards, and it's not so much, I don't think the airlines necessarily care. I think it's going to mm -hmm. be your country that you're entering is going to, is going to care. Can I just ask, are they not saying the person with the vaccine, it lowers the chance of them transmitting it? They're saying if it gets transmitted to someone with the vaccine, it lowers the chance that that person will then die or get terribly sick from it? 
Correct, correct. We don't know. I mean, it is possible that getting the vaccine also de- decreases your chance of transmission. We just don't have enough data yet. We just don't know yet. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Also, while you were giving those last answers, just since everyone probably saw I was looking down on my yeah. phone, I've since added on my link tree the sources to follow for information. So Meta and Del Rio and all those. Okay, so, so when people say the vaccine changes your DNA, that's total misinformation, right? Yes, that's completely... First These are all, people who couldn't tell me how DNA works. Tell me what DNA is, please. Right, yeah. So if, if you don't understand transcription and translation, yeah, this, so this is not at all what it is. If you, so I don't want to go through the whole explanation again, but if you look at yeah. the last not the one I just did five minutes ago, but the one that we did a couple months ago, um, uh, we, I actually like did a little drawing and put, we put up a little image of why the mRNA vaccine can't really change your DNA. Um, yeah. So it's on Honey LeBron's YouTube right now. So you can see that. I've been told <coughs> to give me cancer in 10 to 15 years as well. I mean, again, a lot of this is just people it's kind of that whole idea of a little bit of information is a dangerous thing. Like they barely understand stuff. So first of all, cancer isn't one thing unless what you are saying is unless you actually understand that at a molecular level, all cancer starts with derangement of apoptotic signaling. Okay. So if that's what you're suggesting, which nobody is ever suggesting when they go, I need a cure for cancer, right? Unless that's your fundamental understanding of cancer, you don't actually understand cancer. Right. Mm -hmm. So loss of apoptotic signaling essentially means apoptosis. People say apoptosis. That's not actually correct. Apoptosis is cell death. Right. Cells are programmed to die after a certain period of time. If they lose that ability to die after a certain period of time, they grow unchecked. Cancer. Mm -hmm. So, yes, at one level, that is the most basic explanation of cancer. There are many things that can cause cancer. Right. There's the two hit mutation hypothesis, which is you have a mutation to your DNA and that might be something that you're born with. And it means nothing because it's just the one mutation. And remember, DNA is double stranded. But then a freak set of occurrences happen and you live near a radioactive power plant or you fish from a stream that's dumping pesticides. Right. Something is going on and then you you somehow have an environmental exposure that causes a second mutation. Boom, now you, now you can develop cancer, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there are many other things to worry about, in my opinion, than, I mean, can I guarantee you're not going to get cancer in 15 years? No. Can you prove that it came from a vaccine you had 15 years ago? No. Mm-hmm. I'm far more likely to get cancer not from this vaccine. Like, if I get breast cancer in 15 years, I'm chalking that up to all the dairy that I ingested most of my life. <laughs> Probably, right? yeah. Not the vaccine that I had 15 years ago. So I think that we do far more dangerous things that are more likely to cause cancer than a vaccine. Yeah. I only have one question. If you're vaccinated, can you still carry or infect even if you aren't going to get infected? So I think your terminology is a little bit confused. So a carrier still has to have infected, like you are being infected versus being symptomatic are two different things, right? So being a carrier is having an asymptomatic infection. There's no way for your body to hold on to the virus unless the virus is within your cells, right? It's Mm -hmm. not like the virus is just going to be floating around in the air in your nostrils because you'd breathe that out or you'd breathe it in and then breathe it out, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, and I don't mean that to sound like I'm being a smart ass. I'm just trying to explain that in order for you to be a carrier, the only way that can happen is you inhale or, you know, you breathe in some virus. It attaches to the ACE2 receptor on your cells. It then enters the cells, does its thing. It starts to replicate like mad, kills off that cell. The cell opens up, releases a bunch of the virus. Then those cells go on and infect other cells. Mm-hmm. Whether you have symptoms to that or not is a different story. And we don't clearly understand why some people can just asymptomatically carry it and why some people will have symptoms. Right. We do know that there are certain risk factors, right? Being uh, heavily overweight, being uh, type 2 diabetic, having hypertension. These we know are risk factors, right, for worse outcomes. Right. We don't understand what specifically about that. We could Mm -hmm. speculate that type 2 diabetes is related to being immune compromised. Right. 
We could speculate that it has to do with cytokine storm, right? But in order for you to actually be a carrier, you have to have an infection. It's just an asymptomatic infection. So if you are vaccinated, you st at this point, we still are not sure whether or not you can, we, we think that what it, what it does is it decreases the chance that if you get infected that you're gonna have such severe symptoms that you end up hospitalized, disabled, or dead. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get infected or that you can't pass it on to people. Again, not that I love the flu analogy, but when you get the flu vaccine, it doesn't guarantee you're not going to get the flu. What it does is shorten the course if you're going to get the flu, and it makes you have a less severe course. Right, right. That's what the flu vaccine does. So in yeah. the same way, this is the reason to get this vaccine more than the flu is because this vaccine protects you from severe death, and, you know, severe disability or death. But also, just like with the flu shot, the more people that are vaccinated, the less the virus can survive long term and get passed back and forth between people, right? Mm -hmm. If you can get the virus, but you're asymptomatic, you're likely to have a lower viral, uh, lower viral load, right? If you have a lower viral load, then you can't spread a higher viral load to somebody else, right? If that person is vaccinated, then they're not likely to get a high viral load, right? And then if they pass it on to somebody else who's infected, they're not likely to have a high viral load, right? So eventually it dies out. So the analogy that I've been using is, and you have to be a sci-fi geek to understand this analogy. <laughs> if you watched Star Trek SG-1, think of the virus like the Gwold, which was this parasitic race, right, that needed humans as hosts. Mm -hmm. If we make our bodies less hospitable to the virus, then the virus can't spread as far and can eventually die out. And can I ask, so the vaccine, we know that we can't say definitively that it prevents you from getting COVID or transmitting COVID, but can we say it gives you a better chance of having a lower viral load, which makes you less likely no, to I mean, transmit it? No, we're speculating at this point. We're speculating, yeah. but the way that herd immunity works, generally speaking, is that when you get a vaccine, it makes you less hospitable to the virus for a lesser period of time. Remember, yeah. there's a 14-day incubation period yeah. for this virus. Right? That's what makes it so dangerous and deadly. So the more people that get, and the fact that there's asymptomatic spread, right? So for example, with TB, people aren't really typically asymptomatic and then spreading TB, right? They're typically symptomatic, and then that's how they're spreading it, right? You have to have a cough, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. so, so people are going to notice if you're coughing, right? But if I'm just breathing on you and I have COVID, then I can give it to you. But if, if 80% of the population is inhospitable to the virus, mm -hmm. right, to, at, at some level, then it's much more likely that the virus can't continue to mutate, right? Mm -hmm. It's also much more likely that the virus either dies out or becomes more like the flu. Over time, our own bodies start to develop smarter mechanisms of resistance, and the virus itself no longer becomes this virulent strain, right? Right. Until, you know, the next outbreak happens because of factory farms. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, and also, like you said, a virus loves time, and a virus loves a higher number of hosts. And I think there's something so beautiful about that 80-20 law found everywhere in nature, but it's kind of like this. Yeah. Once we hit 80% threshold of the population as vaccinated, the, the virus just, it, it, it takes such a hit in terms of how much time it has to find a new host because it's not going to find new hosts and it's going to run out of time and right. it's going to die faster than it's able to continue to infect people. Right. The other thing to remember is if you're thinking, oh, 80 percent, whatever, I'll just be one of the 20 percent. No, the 20 percent are going to be kids that can't get it. People with active cancer having chemo, people who have solid organ transplants that we don't know if they'll mount an immune response. Right. So one of the things that in all of these trials, they're only including people in these trials that we believe have a chance of mounting an immune response. So as an example, Many of the trials excluded HIV patients. Some of the, some of the trials that are ongoing right now 
are including HIV patients, but these are HIV patients that have CD4 counts greater than 200, that have never had an AIDS-defining illness, because these people we know can mount an immune response. It makes no sense to trial a vaccine in someone who can't mount a response to it, Yeah. right? Because if that vaccine is then proven to not work, all you've done is prove that a vaccine doesn't work in people that don't have an immune response. Right. right, like people that you already knew weren't going to respond, but you might accidentally say, "Oh, the vaccine doesn't work at all." Throw it out, and it might have worked perfectly in people that have immune responses. And right? so we're saying people who are critically ill or or, or organ transplant um, recipients, like those, are people who are less likely to have a robust immune response and be able to benefit from the vaccine. Yeah, well, and that's yeah, why they're that twenty percent. Yeah. So, for example, we don't. So people. People who get like lung transplants, for example, they do get vaccines. They can't get live virus vaccines. Um, they have to get like va vaccines that don't include um, genetic material that include like like the flu shot, which is like part of the protein coat that's ingested into you, right? Or injected mm -hmm. into you, right? So those are safe for those folks. But in the try, and it's possible that solid, certain solid organ transplant recipients will be able to mount an immune response. We just don't know right now because all of the trials are excluding these people, right? Because, again, yeah, because it's, not the, it's not the demographic you would want to start with. Correct. A vaccine trial is always going to be started in healthy volunteers, yep. right? Because again, in order to prove that, that humans, generally speaking, can mount an immune response to something, you have to pick people that you know don't already have a suppressed immune system. Yeah. So, yeah, that sounds simple enough. Yeah. So be part of the 80% to get vaccinated so that we're not being selfish, so we can set aside a 20% option for people not to get vaccinated and let those be the people who just got a lung transplant or they are critically ill, you know, not, not or people like who are like... a bone transplant or... Yeah, <laughs> but not people who are like, I believe in the deep state and the blah, 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 and the government conspiracy. That is not an option to not get vaccinated. You're being yeah. selfish. And, and honestly, I hate to generalize, but in my experience, the people who give in to those kind of thoughts are generally people who are in a position of privilege that allows them to lead a life free of real immediate threats to their well-being that right, they, ha they have to imagine all of these things to be afraid of because they're not going to get you know shot and killed by police right. and they're not food insecure but they still live in our world so they're still exposing themselves and their unvaccinated germs right yeah. to people at the grocery store who aren't don't have that kind of privilege right so yeah. the reason I don't go out to eat is not only do I not want to get sick, I don't want to get people at the, at the restaurant sick. And the other thing, the other reason I don't want to go is exactly like what you're saying. There are people working in restaurants, right? I guarantee you there are people front of house, back of house, whatever, that are sick and coming to work because they feel oh, yeah. they don't have a Oh, yeah. And, and, and let me tell you something. I don't really have a lot of blame or anger towards a restaurant worker making two thirty seven an hour and tips for coming Thank to you. work when they're sick. Right? Mm -hmm. Would I, I mean, to, would I like them to not do that? Of course I would like them to not do that. Right? Yeah. When I when I was talking about the bar analogy, it wasn't so much the drag queen trying to do the show that I was annoyed by. It's the people freaking showing up to the bar. Right. Right? Do a live show on Zoom. Like, I can understand why the drag queen's doing it. Of course, if the people showing up to the bar stop showing up, the drag queen won't be able to do a show there. But it's like, let's all help e help the drag queen out by staying home and supporting her show and tipping. Right. Well, right, like, let the drag queen, you know, do a show on Zoom mm -hmm. or film it, you know, film it in an empty bar, right? Yes, yes. I've seen some people doing that. I applaud live, that. Live stream it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and pay the person for their labor. So, yeah, it's just, it's, it, so to me, the issue is not, I mean, uh, from, from my standpoint, the problem is not, like, this whole disingenuous nonsense of, well, I have to go to restaurants because I need to support waitstaff. That's bullshit. You can tip on takeout. 
There's no right. rule that says that takeout doesn't require right. 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 Oh, thank you for saying that. <laughs> that right? I mean, as a restaurant worker who's done takeout yeah. and been that person, we're expecting a tip as well. And I'll tell you, I was somebody who never used to tip for takeout mm. before because I just didn't understand. Right, and right, I, right. I just, and a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, waited tables for many years while she was in vet school. And working with her is really how I learned. Like, I had no idea how little wait staff made. Right. And sometimes they make good money, but the thing is, if you don't make any money, your employer no, no, looks at you and they're like, I'm so sorry, and no, you just go home broke. But here's the problem. Any system that requires people to perform on command to make money is not an okay system. What I mean by that is people should be allowed to have a bad day at work and that not translate to, oh, shit, I made no tips. Now I can't pay for rent or I can't pay for, you know, my kid's, you know, music class or my kid can't eat lunch this week, right? right. Like we should not. So, you know, when I lived in Australia, you don't tip in Australia unless you just get super incredibly phenomenal service. Why? Mm -hmm. Because right. workers there make a living wage and right. on holidays and on Sundays, they just point blank tell you all the restaurants say there's a 10% surcharge. Why? Because in order for them to hire people to come in on a Sunday and work or on a holiday and work, they mm -hmm. have to pay their staff more money. And right. who's going to pay for that? It's going to be right. the people who want to be waited on. This right. whole idea, it, I find it really gross that we've come to a world, we've come to the point where people think they have the right to be waited on. Because that's fundamentally what's happening, right? Most of the people complaining about going to restaurants just miss the peons, like, you know, waiting on them, right? They miss, they miss the peasant class waiting on them, right? And I find that insane. Hearing that requires doing work. I say that because a lot of people will hear that and just let it go by like a cloud thought and not take responsibility for it. You won't be able to hear that without doing the work to hear that. You know, and we thing, need to hear that. I mean, another thing I did when the pandemic started is because I did not want vegan businesses to go out of business. Right. Sure. So yeah. I started buying gift cards to all these businesses. Right. Knowing that, yes, if the business goes out of business, that's a gamble and I've lost that money, but whatever. Yeah. Right. So and also with the plan that once the businesses were allowed to open up again for takeout, I only used that like I only use my gift card like every other visit. Right. Because, again, now the restaurant has opened. If, only, if everybody only uses the gift cards they bought when they were closed, they're still not making any money. Right. Right, 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 right. So, so, yeah. So, I mean, there are so many ways that you can support people without endangering them and endangering yourself. And so mm -hmm. this whole like, I mean, this is this is a uniquely American thing, right? We have the right to go to bars. We have the right to party. We have the right to, you know, it's it's one of those things that I used to joke in medical school about how in America, someone will come to the ER and it'll be like a 90 year old grandma who's been in and out of the nursing home and every month is brought to the ER because her sacral decubitus ulcer is now infected again and she's going to have another bout of sepsis and she's grimacing every time you try to put an IV in her because she's old and all her veins are burnt out and she doesn't want to be there and she's fighting you the whole time. But hey, her family is telling you, nope, you have to do all this stuff to her. Um, and whether that's because there's a financial incentive for them because they get a check from the government that is now going to the family or whether it's that they just can't let go of them because it's grandma and we love grandma, right? There are times that we, we believe in America that we have the right to certain things. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, nobody should have the right to futile care, right? That's, get, that's going to prolong agony and also rack up health care costs, right? Take up a hospital bed for somebody that could actually use it and then benefit from it. Yep. Okay. And I'm not suggesting that we don't take care of people. I'm suggesting that we use common sense and not offer dialysis to the person who is, you know, going to die today for sure. 
and is and dialysis is not going to change that no. right but that's not the attitude that we have in this country in india if you brought in a 90 year old grandmother to the er people the doctors would be like what the hell is wrong with you why would you do this to your grandmother do you not care about your grandmother why yeah. would you put her through this and it's so easy for well this is a speciesist thing but it's so easy for people to recognize that line when it's their dog or cat mm -hmm. so easy to like i'm not going to put my dog through that yeah but your 94 year old grandma like she needs this surgery to save her life like she's had her life so and i'm not I... suggesting that it's over because she's 94 i intend to live to be 135 years old and i know that it's a fact it's going to happen but, but I mean, like it's a functional status right it's, it's a quality it's... of life thing right right so that's the thing i'm like we will fight tooth and nail for quantity of life and ignore quality of life yeah you know so one of the things that happened with my grandmother is um, when she was 88, she uh, broke her hip. And so she had hip surgery. And she had forgotten, I, you know, for her 85th birthday, I had made her DNR. That was my presence to her, was to make her DNR. Um, and she had forgotten about that. And my uncle was a pediatrician, so he was at work. She lived with him. She, he was at work. And... My grandmother calls me like super upset, like super upset. And, is, and I'm like, what is happening? And she goes, listen, someone just came in here and asked if my heart stopped beating. Would they want, would they, would I want to be shocked and put on a ventilator and all this stuff? And then she goes, what the hell is wrong with Americans? Why would they do that to me? I'm 88 years old. Why would anybody ever do that to an 88 year old woman? And then she goes, if they do that to me, you better sue them. <laughs> And I was like, Grandma, no, no, no. It's like, listen, I, we, I call her Mortiae. That was that's the term that we use in our language. I was like, no, just calm down. That's not what they're saying. They're legally required to ask that. All you need to do is say, I am DNR. My son will bring you the paperwork. And then she mm. did. She was just mm. like, she was just like, I don't know what the hell is wrong with American doctors that they would ever do that to an 88 year old woman. But, you know. Well, and it kind of, it, it's interesting to like, if we take an, a look at the overview here, we can kind of see that the trend is, let's let other belief systems dictate medicine. Yeah. That's like the common denominator through this whole anti-vax bullshit and through all of these like, no, we have to keep her alive at all costs. And it's only like, like the whole Terry it, Schiavo thing, you know, yeah, where we're like, yeah. we have to keep her alive. It's like, she's gone. Yeah. Well, and it's only this is one thing that frustrates us in the medical on the medical side of things versus the surgical side of things. Right. So patient is in the ICU. They have a septic abdomen, but they're critically ill. They're totally unstable. Right. They're like really, really high risk of death. Right. Just existing in the ICU, let alone trying to go to the OR. But you mm -hmm. do your due diligence. You call the surgeon. Surgeon takes one look at the patient and says, nope, not a surgical candidate. Nobody ever no. fights that. Nobody ever says, hang on, nope, I want everything done. I want you to take my grandmother to surgery. <sighs> right? Yeah. Because the surgeon will go, well, she's going to die on the table, so that's not going to happen. And I think these are conversations we probably need to be having with our families and, and loved ones before it's our time, right? Yeah, so I make, I, when I talk to patients, I ideally make them DNR, if that's appropriate, in clinic. Um, when they come in to see me. So the person with advanced COPD who's got really, really bad lung function is on oxygen. Um, that's when I have the conversation with them. And I just say, hey, have you thought about what would you want for yourself if you had a really bad COPD attack and the BiPAP mask didn't work and the antibiotics didn't work and the only option at that point was to put you on a ventilator? Have you thought about what you would want? And, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit. And usually they'll say, well, what do you think I should do? And I'll tell them, look, my concern based on your lung function is that the likelihood that you would ever come off the ventilator is slim to none or isn't very good. You know, whatever the case may be, right, in, con mm -hmm. in the context of what that person's lung function is, right, mm -hmm. or what their functional status is. I mean, I always tell them, look, it's entirely up to you. There are no guarantees in life, right? Like, I, there are weird, unexplainable things happen every once in a while in medicine. So I can't guarantee that you would be vent dependent. But based on my considerable experience, this is the most likely scenario for you, far more likely than you having some miraculous recovery and coming off the ventilator. 
And mm -hmm. I explain to them that your diaphragm gets weaker as soon as you go on the ventilator and as a COPD or your diaphragm's already slightly weak. And we go over it in enough detail. And I say the reason I'm talking with you about it now is not because I think your death is imminent. It's because the time to have that discussion is now, not when you're in the middle of a COPD attack. Because right, when you're gasping right. for breath, if someone says, hey, should we put a tube down your throat, you're going to say yes. Yeah. Even if that means that you will never come off the ventilator. However, yeah. if you've had that conversation before, then your doctors can say to you, hey, we just want to confirm that given what's going on with you, you're not making improvements. Our only option is a ventilator or to focus on making you comfortable so that you're not so uncomfortable and continuing the antibiotics. Is that what you want? Oh, I, I, I think that kind of means you're on your way out, right? Well, I mean, again, there's always this slight possibility at that point that someone may make a miraculous turnaround, right? Yeah. But, but typically speaking, by the time you're having that conversation, it's like, no, we do not believe that you can survive this unless we yeah. put you on a ventilator. But again, yeah. I mean, I can put you on a ventilator and you can live that way. And some people are fine with that. Some people are like, nope, I'll just be a chronic vent patient. The problem is, is that I have no way of knowing whether you're going to be the chronic vent patient who's awake and can talk on the vent and can be in a wheelchair and hang out with their family and do great. Or if you're going to a long-term acute care facility and you never really wake up and you're so uncomfortable, even with your trach, that you're going to be snowed you know, for the rest of your life, and then, you know, you're going to have atrophy and ulcers from being in the bed, and then those ulcers are going to get infected, and then you've got a central mm. line, and that's going to cause you to get a bloodstream infection, and, you know, maybe you need a Foley catheter, and so now you've got a urinary tract infection, and then you get septic, so, you know. So, it's a so lot it's, easier to think about the future when my current present moment isn't an emergency. Right. I mean, I wouldn't have that conversation with you simply because at your age, you're likely to do well if you had a bad pneumonia and ended up on a ventilator, right? So the yeah. analogy that I use for a lot of people is it's a question of reserve, right? If you're 45 years old and you fall off a cliff, right, we're going to try everything we can to save you. You're 45 years old. The likelihood that you can recover from that is much greater than if you're 85 years old. Yeah. Right. So, so that's really what it comes down to is a lot of it is. And so again, the functionality is also an important thing because the flip side of that is I know vegan 60 year olds that are healthier than non vegan 30 year olds. Mm -hmm. Right. So you always have to take functionality into account, right? Yeah. One of my uh, mentors in the critical care world told me a story that when he was a med student, he was visiting his grandfather who was admitted to the hospital. His grandfather was in his 80s, but was highly functioning, still you know, running every single day, running his own company, was the CEO of his own company, and was running it day to day, no evidence of dementia, no evidence of delirium, active, super functional, full life, right? He got a little confused in the ICU and they called a neurology consult. And so my attending at the time, he was a medical student visiting his grandfather, was wearing his white coat, comes to see his grandfather. The neurologist is in the room, sees a medical student, just assumes that he's on the ICU team, because the guy's in the ICU now because he's acting weird and confused, assumes mm -hmm. that this is one of the ICU team medical students, doesn't realize he's the patient's grandson, and just looks at him and says, can you believe what they're doing to this guy? I mean, look at him. He's clearly not going to do well. He's totally out of it, completely altered. Oh my God. Why would they do this to him? Do you know what oh the problem God. was? His IV had gotten a little in local infection, and at that age, even the tiniest little bit of a bacterial infection can oh. cause you to become confused. But you treat the infection, you get rid of the IV, you give him a little antibiotics, he's fine. He went, he went to the floor the next day and then went home the day after that, right? Yeah. So that's why functionality is always important. It's not like I just go, oh, 85 years old, DNR. Right, right. Right? It's, oh, 85 years old, bedridden, you know, has lost both his limbs to diabetes, you know, uh, has had three heart attacks, has an ejection fraction of 5%, you know, is, you know, in and out of the hospital every week, 
that's the kind of person that I'm like, why are we doing this over and over and Mm -hmm. over again to the person? Mm -hmm. But 85 year old running, like Dr. Betty is not someone that I would necessarily argue shouldn't go on. Now you could still make the argument and not, not to pick up. So for those people that don't know who Dr. Betty is, she's like in her eighties and runs marathons and runs like six day races. Okay. Yeah. Like six days awake running for six days marathons in her eighties. So, so if you take someone like her, I don't want to use her as an example, but if you take someone like her, someone who's got that level of fitness, you could Mm -hmm. actually still make the argument that at that age, if she, if, if someone's someone at that age, if their heart were to stop beating, that their brain won't recover from that lack of blood flow, even if you bring them back as well as when they're 48. Right. Mm -hmm. So you could still potentially make that argument. My mother uh, at 74 said she didn't want, when she got sick, said she didn't want to go uh, get a lung transplant and said, I want to be DNR at no time. Do I want you putting me on the ventilator? That was a very reasonable answer because of my mom's lung disease. If she'd Mm -hmm. gone on a ventilator, she never would have come off the ventilator. Yeah. And more importantly, because of the type of lung disease she had, she would not have been comfortable on a ventilator chronically. You know, and that was a, it was a hard decision to make, but it was the right decision to make because mm-hmm. there's nothing worse than watching your family members suffering just for the sake of them being alive. Sure, their heart's beating. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I, I, I can only imagine, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm 42 today. I can only imagine, like, I, I want every fighting chance because I have every intention of living a long time to piss a lot of people yeah. off. But, like, God, I mean, if it meant, like, you know, like, like my mom were, like, suffering, like, uh, 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 I would rather have that conversation with her now. Yeah. You know, when she's, well, when she's what, that's able. That's the problem is that people don't have that com- I mean, I've had that conversation with my family early on but again that's because i see the negative consequences of not having that conversation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know sorry i'm gonna get up and turn my light off <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> i'm gonna say it's, <laughs> it's quite a sunset clause we have here it's like we're saying yeah. goodbye good night um i'm gonna show you but, my, uh, my puppy i don't know if you can see him no hi puppy i saw the picture you posted yesterday where the puppy would just like head down and left please pet me yeah he, he um, kind of he'll walk up to me and then he'll just sort of stick his head between my legs to keep uh, his head steady so that i can scratch his head Is there a oh, way to so flip? Cute. i can't flip the screen right can you see him um you should you should be able to uh, uh you should be able to you see a little circle with like the oh, two yeah, arrows yeah. Okay. chasing hit that Okay, so I just want to tell you that uh, we yeah. were painting. So I'm just going to explain why my room looks like a college dorm. We were. Painting, I mean, you know, you're talking to someone who's got a little mess going on. So. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, so we were painting the house. This is my mother's house, right? We moved in to take care of her. Um, and then after she died, we mm-hmm. needed to sell it. But then the pandemic hit, so we weren't exactly like inviting people into the house. Yeah. So we had the house painted, and in order to do that, it was just easier to get rid of all of our furniture. So I'm literally, you know, like those plastic bins that you can buy at, like, Walmart? Mm -hmm. I bought those Mm -hmm. in college, and that's literally my dresser. Like, I don't actually have a dresser. That's so cute. There he is. That's a hi! Hey! Who's such a cutie? Hi, Kobe! He's actually my brother's dog. Aww. Well, he's so adorable. Mr. Kobe! Okay, hey, he Kobe. Wants go, he wants to leave. He's like, I don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> he he wants to go O U T or no, 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 no. It's his uh, dinner time, and his stomach is like clockwork. Okay. So, so he's going um, to hey, just one. To feed him. One last um, yes or no question, just uh, just yep. quickly, because um, it was asked earlier. Any of the COVID vaccines are any of them live virus vaccines? No, no none of them are. Right. That I know of. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't. I don't think any of them are. Hang on one second. I just want to yeah. make sure I'm giving the right answer. No, sure. Like AstraZeneca, I think, is a different... It's not an mRNA vaccine, but it's not the same. Mm-hmm. To my knowledge, none of them are. Uh, and so the, the, the ones that are not a live virus vaccine, what they've basically done is taken just the spike protein from the coronavirus, one of the thorns in its crown and replicated that so that the, the body's cell can recognize when it's trying to attach and can then mount yes. an immune response. Well, yes and no. So the mRNA vaccines don't do that. The mRNA mm-hmm. vaccines, what they do is they inject 
mRNA into you that mm-hmm. ha- is coded to then use your own cell mechanisms to produce the protein itself, right? But as with all mRNA, it degrades. So after mm-hmm. a couple cycles, a couple, whether it's hours to a couple days, mm-hmm. your cells have already generated the spike protein, yeah. right? And then you, there's no mRNA in your system anymore, but now the spike protein is there, and so now your, um, your immune system can react to it. With the other ones, I think like with AstraZeneca, I think they're actually injecting a manufactured protein, like spike protein. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in a way, it's kind of just like if you allegedly happened to fall into your doctor's syringe face first and got injected with some Sculptra, that just causes your body to produce more collagen in those areas. But what is Sculptra? It doesn't stick around. It's a it's a it's a it's a facial filler that it, it co- sort of like injects instead of like a filler like like um like reju- like um rejuvenator or whatever that just puts a filler in there that lasts temporarily. Sculptra oh, injects you with something that almost works like a scaffold that your body will respond to by building collagen there, and then over time your body builds up that spot by itself. I'm holding my cheeks up because look, I haven't had it in a while, but oh. um it, your body will basically build that up itself and so it lasts a lot longer um than like a filler that just kind of lasts for three to six months this lasts like 18 months because your body builds the stuff itself but the thing that it did that in response to only hangs out for so long and then it's depleted in your body so why do you need them every 18 months your body basically eventually degrades the collagen uh yeah like i I don't think yeah it doesn't yeah 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 also to look pretty well, no, 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 but I mean, what I'm no, saying I'm is, why do you not just need it the one time and then never again? That's right, right, saying. right, exactly. Why does it yeah. stay? Okay. All yeah. right, so, yes, yeah, so let's see, okay. Oh, right, one of them's an adenovirus vector vaccine. That's right, I completely forgot about that. So mm-hmm. adenoviruses, common viruses, like the cold virus, right? I just want to make mm-hmm. sure I know which one this is and what specifically they're doing. I wonder if I can Google this in the meantime. Well, I'm looking at CHOP's website. So CHOP is like probably the best pediatric hospital in the world. And Mm -hmm. they're actually explaining it really well. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're basically using like a plasmid vector. So Mm -hmm. what they're basically doing is the, the adenovirus vaccine, what it does is they take the adenovirus they take a small genetic component of it. That component has the part that allows the genetic material to replicate. Mm -hmm. But they take out one portion that they don't need for replication and insert the uh, SARS-CoV-2 sequence that's responsible for producing the spike protein. Just the spike protein, okay? Then they inject that into you. So now you've mm-hmm. got the, the you've got this portion of a virus within your body that can replicate, but can't do anything else. It can't actually cause infection. Okay, it's kind of like like a head like the headless horseman, right? Headless mm-hmm. horseman can walk around but has no brain, mm-hmm. right? So similar to that. But the other thing that it's now got attached to it is as it's replicating, it's also duplicating the spike protein. Yeah. So now you've got spike protein in your body, and now your immune system can recognize that. But again, yeah. spike protein in and of itself doesn't means nothing. If you have, if I were to just take a bunch of spike protein and inject it into my body, I would have an immune response to that, but I would not have an infection because there's no genetic material attached to that. Yeah, there's right? nothing infecting you. It's just right, right, exactly. Yeah. With it's like admin- if a burglar is coming and he's going to use a skeleton key to get into your house. It's like just sending a bunch of skeleton keys, you know? Correct, correct, correct. Now, with the adenovirus, there is a little bit of genetic material, not for COVID, for the adenovirus, mm-hmm. right? But again, mm-hmm. it's not enough to actually cause a true infection, right? So it's, it's just have- using the adenovirus as a vector to transport correct, that into correct. your system. But now, for someone who, my friend Bauda, she has um, Bichette's, 
uh, if uh, I think Bichette's disease or Bichette's syndrome or Bichette's disorder, Bichette's syndrome. Bichette, Bichette syndrome. Um, and so she can't. She said she can't have live virus um, uh, vaccines. Not a live virus. Yeah. So this is so okay. So so as far as we know, so none of them are live virus vaccines. So anyone no, but, can get. But, but the thing about a lot of these autoimmune diseases and rheumatologic diseases, many of these they haven't tested yet. So really mm. what she needs to do is talk to whoever is managing her condition to find mm -hmm. out if it's safe for her to take it. Because it's not only – there's two questions that need to be answered. Is it safe for her to take it, and will she even mount an immune response? Yeah. Because if there's no chance that she can mount an immune response to the vaccine, why would you put yourself at risk of any of the potential side effects of the vaccine? Right. Right. Because, again, we're not saying there are no side effects to the vaccine. We're just saying from a risk-benefit standpoint, the risk of me having Bell's palsy or Guillain-Barre, both of which are treatable and reversible, versus needing a lung transplant, I'm definitely picking the Bell's palsy. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah. There we go. Well, anyway. I'm... I I, I think I think that's probably a good point to yeah, um should, to I, I to hop off. I answer one question, and as usual, I you know. Talk. I, I was actually thinking, I'm like, score! I got a great, concise episode to post now, and now it's just like this is another two-hour episode. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Hopefully, this answered a bunch of. Oh. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, you know, hopefully this helps to answer questions. Please get vaccinated when you're allowed to get vaccinated. Until you hear Anthony Fauci say you can take your masks off and stop social distancing, don't stop doing those things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm starting to get people persistently. Cases, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say the fact that we're plateauing in cases, this is not the time to stop doing things. It's kind of like if you're weeding your backyard Absolutely. and you go, it's 50% weeded, I can stop. No. <laughs> right. Right. You have, to, right. you have to continue doing the same because the only reason we got to this point was the behaviors that we're doing. Right. Right. And as soon as we stop, it's going to reverse and go back in the direction we don't want. Well, and the, the thing that is insane to me, and this is the last thing I'll say and that I swear I'm going to go, is... Okay. We have literally, during this pandemic, seen this happen, right? We, lock, we, we, we sort of locked down a little bit, not really as much as I or most physicians would like, right? Cases start to plateau. Wait, I'm sorry, I can't hear you right now, um, but it's just because my sister keeps trying to call me for my birthday. Um, oh, okay. Can, can everyone else hear her right now? I'm actually going to take it off of my Bluetooth. Second, and that helps. All right, can y'all hear you now? Yeah, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Huh. Um, can someone in the comments just say, can you hear her? I can't. Can anyone in the comments hear her? Agree? Got okay. Okay, great. So go, go on. I don't know okay, what you're saying, okay. but they can okay. hear you. So what I was basically saying is, now I've tried, totally lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Someone help me. What was I saying? Oh, Lord. Oh, I'm, I'm assuming that you stopped uh, talking. Um, I am, uh, I'm just going to see, can I trick my phone into turning the volume back on? Oh, you lost your train of thought. Yeah, right now, all I can do is act like I hear you and act like what you're saying is making a lot of sense. And I'm really glad I'm hearing it, uh, but I can't hear any of it. So um, I think uh, it's a good st point there to, st I don't know why this, my, my, my getting a phone call caused it to stop my, um, my sound from working, but um, let me just give you a chance to say anything else you need to say before we sign off. No, nope. we're good. Okay. This would be a yeah. fine time for me to have learned ASL. It really would have been. Thank oh, about you. opening I, I, up. One, what, sorry, one more, yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. one more thing. So, so thank you. So what I was saying about opening up is this. We keep partially locking down, then cases plateau, then we reopen, then cases rebound, and we've done that a thousand times. We need to stop doing that. Okay, that's it. Now we're good. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just guessing from body language, I can see that you finished what you were saying. I'm trying to join our conversation on my other phone. Wait, can I hear you now? Can you hear me? Oh, I thought I heard you. It was oh, okay. okay. So at any rate, 
That's uh, so again, um, if you want to say thank you uh, to Dr. Nike for uh, her time and uh, sharing her knowledge, um, make a donation to Vegan Meals That Heal in Atlanta mm -hmm. or for I know the name, but say it again. The, con the Center for the con oh, Science. Oh, Center for Contemporary Sciences. Center for Contemporary Sciences. Look at me able to read lips all of a sudden. So, great. So, make a, a donation to um, Center for Contemporary Sciences. It's contemporarysciences.org um, or um, Vegan Meals That Heal. And um, thank you all so much. Go get vaccinated. Stay home. Keep a mask on. Bye. Thank you, everyone. What a weird way to end that I can't, I suddenly can't hear. There we go. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you guys can still, yeah, okay, good, good, good. I don't know why, my, God bless my sister. She's like trying to call me and I keep hitting decline and then she calls again and it's like, if I'm sending you to voicemail, there's a reason. Uh, but, uh, uh, and this is why I wanted to do this on my other phone because then when people call me, I can quickly answer them like blah, 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 blah. But uh, it was giving me the weird feedback. So at any rate, I'm going to sign off there because I didn't intend for this to go so long. I'm glad that it did. I was going to read chapter one, week one of The Artist's Way on my Instagram live. But I'm going to give myself permission to do that tomorrow just so that I can actually spend the rest of my birthday birthdaying. Um, but uh, don't get me wrong. I was so honored to get to do this uh, on my birthday and share this information. I'm just so grateful that the day we found out there's a New York strain, I found out about it and was able to get the word out to everyone else too. So please um, share this. If you could please, please, please share this with everyone you can, just so that, especially in New York City, um, I'm looking here, the camera's here, sorry, uh, so that we uh, can get this information out. Uh, how lucky are we, how lucky am I that a, a doctor, a lung doctor, is a friend of mine and just constantly is like, hey, can I give an update to your followers? So all four of you. So thank you so much for um, helping me. Thank you in advance for your questions and your time and attention and for helping, excuse me, and for helping me get the word out uh, as far as possible. Um, also, by the way, just gonna ask for my birthday uh, on all of my Facebook profiles. I'm doing a fundraiser right now for A Well-Fed World. They are an organization that basically helps to fund other organizations helping to fight world hunger and animal exploitation. So consider making a donation to, a donation to them on my Facebook fundraiser. Um, and lastly, my solo play is uh, online only until uh, March 20th. So as my birthday present, I'm hoping as many people as possible will go and watch my play uh, and let me know that they saw it and let me know what they think. Um, it is in the link in my bio. So um, it's coming clean. It's uh, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash no www comingcleanplay.com. Uh, not for kids, not for safe for work, probably not for anyone who is distantly related to me. But um, that said, uh, enjoy the show, make a donation, and uh, please share this episode. And uh, I love you all. Thank you all so much. Bye.